regular meeting of the Newport News School Board for Tuesday, February 21st, 2023. On behalf of the members of the school board and our interim superintendent, Dr. Mitchell, I welcome each of you present this evening and those who are watching on TV and online. A quorum is present to transact the business of the school division. I am going to pause here because there are some new faces that are going to be uh, on the dais this evening from here. Uh, we have Dr. Mitchell, our interim superintendent. We are very thankful for her willingness to serve in this capacity until we are able to select a new superintendent for Newport News Public Schools. Also, I'd like to invite Maritza Alger to come on up. She is coming to us as a member of the South District, a wealth of knowledge in K through 12 education, and most importantly, here for the students and a heart for the students in Newport News. So welcome. Let's give them both a hand. We will begin tonight's meeting with the invocation and pledge to the flag. Here to do the honors are two students from Stoney Run Elementary School, Brooklyn Oldham and Amy Chang. First, Brooklyn will come forward and deliver the invocation. Hi, Brooklyn. Hi. Good afternoon. My name is Brooklyn Onam, and I am in fifth grade at Stony Run Elementary School. I am 10 years old, and I like to go to church and learn. Today, I will be reading a poem called The Power of One by Ashish Ram. One song can spark a moment. One whisper can wake the dream. One tree can start a forest. One bird can hurdle spring. One smile begins a friendship. One mo moment can make one fall in love. One star, star can guide a ship at sea. One word can frame the goal. One vote can change a nation. One sunbeam lights a room. One candle wipes out darkness. One laugh will conquer gloom. One step must start each journey. One word must start each prayer. One hope will rise our spirits. One touch can show you care. One voice can speak with wisdom. One heart can know what's true. One life can make a difference. You see, it's up to you. Thank you very much, Brooklyn. Now, Amy will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Hello, I am Amy. I'm 11 years old, and one of my hobbies are writing. Can everyone please stand for as we recite the school pledge? Thank okay. you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Amy, before you go, we did not get to hear all your hobbies and all your interests. We were very <laughs> eager to say our pledge. <laughs> Would you share with us about your um, your interests? I like uh, drawing in my free time and like writing a lot. Very good. Well, thank you for coming tonight. Thank you. You both did an amazing job in supporting Brooklyn and Amy tonight are their families and members of their school family. So if you all would, please stand and be recognized. The board really does appreciate the encouragement that you've given the students, and we thank you for bringing them tonight. So we're happy to have you with us. The next item on tonight's agenda is school board recognition. So, Dr. Mitchell, please join me at the podium.
So good evening. And tonight the school board has the honor of recognizing someone that each of us holds extremely dear. Someone who assists and guides us each and every day. The Newport News School Board Clerk, Miss Tiffany Moore Buffalo. So if you would please come and join us. Each February, the Virginia School Board Association designates School Board Clerk Appreciation Week. For us, it should be School Board Appreciation Year. Uh, and it is designed, of course, to, to recognize and acknowledge the work and assistance the school board clerks provide to school board members, superintendents, and the school community at large. Just a little about what they do. School board clerks are responsible for keeping records of meeting doc and documenting official proceedings of the school board, preparing and posting meeting agendas, we've had a few, organizing meeting schedules, and providing administrative support, among other duties. However, Ms. Buffalo, Ms. Buffalo maintains a complete and accurate record of all school board proceedings, including maintaining the board's online meeting protocols through board docs. She also maintains the board's calendar, coordinates and schedules our professional development, and serves as a liaison between the school board and the public. Simply put, she is a huge asset and a vital member of the school board team. Ms. Buffalo, on behalf of the school board, administration, and citizens of this community, we thank you and we appreciate you keeping us in line. So at this time, we will take a six minute break so that our student presenters and their families may first take a picture with us and then you can leave if you choose to. And then during this time, our viewing audience will be able to enjoy this month's school board spotlight. We will stand in recess for about six minutes. Thank you. You would think a group called Girls on the Run would be all about running, but it's so much more than that. Girls on the Run Hampton Roads helps students gain the skills to grow emotionally, socially, and physically to fully unlock each girl's power and potential. Twice a week through the fall season, 167 girls participated in the after-school club at General Stanford, Greenwood, Hydenwood, Jenkins, Johnson, Knollwood Meadows, McIntosh, Rich Neck, and Sedgefield Elementary Schools. Coaches consisting of school staff, community volunteers, and CNU members of Gamma Phi Beta Sorority led the student teams through dynamic lessons, team building exercises, fun games, and training runs, all designed to equip each girl to develop strength of character, empathy and compassion for others, decision-making skills, and confidence in who they are. By sharing life experiences and talking about their emotions honestly, the girls grow closer as a team, creating lasting friendships and building a faithful support network to lean on when life gets tough. For the adult coaches, the experience is just as rewarding as they impact the lives of these young ladies in a positive way. Girls on the Run also reinforces community involvement empowering the girls to use the social and emotional skills they've developed by serving others. On each team, 
the students choose their own community impact project, such as General Stanford's team making handmade holiday cards in December for military personnel and educators. After 11 weeks of meeting, growing, and training, Girls on the Run Hampton Roads hosted their culminating event, a celebratory 5K race at Mariner's Museum. With Girls on the Run at many schools across Hampton Roads, almost 2,200 runners gathered to run the 3.1 mile course, with many more family members, educators, and community volunteers cheering on the runners. Each girl selected a buddy to run alongside, with many girls choosing a family member or their favorite teacher to share in the momentous occasion. While physically running a 5K race as an elementary student is an accomplishment all its own, the excitement of crossing the finish line is just the start. Girls on the Run has equipped these young ladies with the skills, knowledge, and tools to navigate life's ups and downs, since every lesson taught can be utilized in all areas of their lives. From here, these girls will continue to reach for seemingly unattainable goals with confidence and their friends' support as they reach their highest potential. Luckily, for second grade students at Carver and Hilton Elementary Schools, swimming in the winter doesn't have to be a polar plunge. Not when you have access to an indoor heated pool at the Y. Newport News Public Schools has partnered with the YMCA this school year to offer second grade Learn to Swim for students at Carver and Hilton. From November through February, each second grade class from both schools took turns traveling to the Tom and Ann Honeycutt Family YMCA along Warwick Boulevard for their swim lessons. For the students, the entire experience was free. Transportation between the Y and school was provided there was no cost for the swim lessons or pool access, and if students didn't have a bathing suit, the YMCA kindly provided them. Each class spent an hour a day for four days, receiving lessons on water safety, floating, going underwater, jumping in, and generally building more confidence in the water. On the first day of the week, each student was personally evaluated and then placed in one of three groups based on their swimming level. YMCA's certified staff and volunteers created a caring and safe environment for each student, helping them overcome their fears and build competency in swimming. With drowning being the second leading cause of unintentional death among children ages 5 to 14, it's important for our students to receive this unique learning opportunity, especially with our city's geographical location on a peninsula. After this year's successful pilot program, even more students across Newport News Public Schools will hopefully receive these important lessons from the YMCA in the coming years. For over a decade, Computer Science Education Week has allowed students to enjoy valuable hands-on experiences and learn firsthand the importance of gaining computing skills as they prepare for their future careers. At Heinz Middle School, educators spent the first week in December offering a variety of computer science themed activities for all students to explore new technologies. ISTEM instructor Hannah Cagle worked with librarian Caitlin McCoy and instructional technology coach Kirsten Vandegrift to create fun and engaging learning opportunities. Each day, interested students headed to the library during their resource block to design a keychain using a 3D printer, code with Lego robots, or create and print their own custom decals using Canva and Cricut. Through each activity, students learned how to use new software, web-based apps, and computer coding. Educators guided students through each lesson, while students from the school's own robotics team gladly shared their knowledge and expertise with their peers. Through many of the activities, students walked away with a custom token. But more importantly, they gained new knowledge and an appreciation for the field of computer science. Newport News students are assisting Christopher Newport University as they transform the fear of climate change into hope founded on science-based solutions. With rising sea levels, deforestation of the Atlantic white cedar, and the formation of ghost forests as biodiverse coastal ecosystems die off, 
CNU's Fear to Hope project is focused on engaging and mentoring high school students in authentic research efforts to study how Atlantic white cedar saplings are affected by salt water. By working alongside high school students in five different school systems, CNU hopes to increase their ability to collect research data while empowering students to gain valuable workplace skills. In Newport News Public Schools, an achievable dream is continuing their partnership that began in 2021, while Woodside High School is joining the project for the first time this school year. CNU biology students visit each high school throughout the school year to explain the purpose of their joint research project, engage the students in the process, and record measurements as the seedlings grow. Once the Atlantic white cedars adjusted to their transplanting, the students began introducing different concentrations of salt water to simulate the rise of ocean waters. Students measure the growth and appearance of the seedlings periodically to see how well they respond to salt intrusion. By collecting this data at numerous high schools, students are gaining real-world experience through meaningful research while using the scientific method to better understand the resiliency of coastal forests against the negative effects of climate change. scheduled in the early part of our agenda and also towards the end of the meeting. As advertised, citizens may submit comments via email up to 30 minutes prior to our meeting time to be included in the official meeting record. For those of you joining us in person, the board considers this an opportunity to listen to your comments. Please understand that we will consider your concerns. We ask that you comply with our three-minute time limit. As you begin your comments, a green light will come on. A yellow, a yellow light signals that you have 30 seconds remaining, and a red light and a beep indicates your time is up. As your name is called, please come forward. First, I have Colleen Renthrow. Good evening, board members. My name is Colleen Renthrow. I'm a single mother of two that uh, two children attending the school district. I was here last month in a state of absolute outrage, and yet here I stand again with the same same feelings, and I know that I'm not alone. Teachers, parents, and children feel unsafe and uncertain. There has been another six-year-old found with a gun in a, uh, on premises in a nearby district, and just as of yesterday, violent uh, threats were reported at Rich, Rich Neck Elementary again. This is not just a rich neck problem. This is a national problem, and we are still begging for you to take the lead on this fight, yet our dist district is failing. Our children are terrified, our teachers are struggling, and our parents, dr parents dread a call from an NPS every day. Teachers are told to preach against bullying in the schools while they are strongly encouraged, one might even say bullied, to underreport, downplay, or ignore poor personal behavior problems that N N so that NNPS can have a stellar record. Students are frustrated by the lack of action when uh, by the lack of action when they have the courage to come forth with a problem and parents are fed up with empty words broken promises and bloated budgets dear board members we demand action from you please 
we entrust we, you with the people that mean the most in the world to us, and all we seem to get is inaction and, ex and excuses. We don't want lowered standards for higher graduation rates. We want ninety. Uh, we don't want the ninety some thousand dollars that was spent on metal detector. We want the ninety some thousand that was spent on metal detectors to be taken out of the Warwick High gym and put to good use. We want our, our administration with. Uh, oh gosh, I'm sorry. Uh, our, our teachers to be able to uh, report to administration without being fearful of losing their jobs. Actions and have uh, actions have consequences, and children children must learn that as well as elected officials. Voting is our right, and this is your job. I will con uh, conclude and with an edited list of my demands that I made last time, uh, as uh, we met, as I'm sure they were not properly heard. We demand accountability from elected officials. We demand that the city council and NNPD play a part in resolving the state of our schools. This is a community issue. We remind you that we put put you in those chairs and, and can and will vote you out. This, uh, this de uh, We demand a return of parental responsibility. We demand that teachers are permitted to use fair and just discipline in the classroom and are treated with respect with all, by all students. We demand budget transparency and good use of taxpayer money. We demand that uh, we demand to be active participants in the safety and well-being of our students and teachers without closed doors. And again, I personally demand that the tears of the kids uh, that are scared of their school safety haunt you until you do your job and protect these babies. Parents and teachers are forced to deal with this every day, as should you be. Have a good evening, and I will see you next month. The next person is L.J. Renthrop. Can I move this thing down a little Absolutely. bit? Absolutely. <laughs> Hello, my name is L.J. Renthrop. Hello, my name is L.J. Renthrop, and I'm a fifth grader in Hilton Elementary Schools. And I've drew some pictures about all the cool stuff I've done, and may I? I made a girls soccer team because the boys would not let the girls play and I feel like that was very unfair so I needed to make it right. So when I and then I we're learning about the layers of the earth in our science and we're learning about a sixth grade standard in math, PEMDAS. And we're also just starting the rock cycle. And I would really like to ask something of you, and it is for you guys to keep me safe and alive while I can do much more stuff to make the world a better place. Thank you. Next we have Michael Bartley. Up to move this back up. All right. Yes. Um, school board members, um, um, interim superintendent Mitchell, uh, thank you for letting me speak and not losing my card this time, like last time, when uh, either it was petty incompetence or petty vindictiveness that happened. And I uh, actually wanted to come speak to you guys about this this one for a couple of years and talk to several uh, months of time because April 8th there is a total eclipse next year, and I would ask you either change the schedule to move spring break back a week or add a day at the end. I plan on being in Sandusky, Ohio. It's an 11 hour drive without that kind of traffic and I'd like to be able to let my kids experience that. But the reason why I am here like most other people is I wanna talk about what happened at Rich Neck Elementary School. And people don't, well, we have heroes there and heroes don't wake up thinking they're gonna be a hero. They're just presented with an opportunity that may not exist once in their lifetime. And whereas we ex unfortunately expect heroic acts from our teachers, we don't expect it from our students. And there was a student there that was told, I'll kill you if you tell anyone I showed you this gun. And they still showed, and they still told, and nothing was done. And I worry about this student. Is he gonna regret the rest of his life? What could I have done? What could I have done to save this woman from being shot? And unfortunately, there's nothing you could do because he didn't fail us, his sidekick did. 
And so what I want to say to this child, this wonderful child, probably the best citizen in Newport News, is next October, when all your friends are putting on a costume, you won't be. Because you actually are a superhero. You're the pint-sized protector of Newport News. And we need to make sure we can have sidekicks for all the other heroes that we have here. And I want to ask you, interim superintendent, to get sidekicks for all of the heroes we have that won't let them down. And I ask you, the board, if Dr. Mitchell does a good job, like the last time you had an interim that people liked, don't kick her to the curb like you did last time. So the last thing is superheroes have toys made of them and stuffies. And so my, uh, my daughter is in the sixth grade and uh, enjoys sewing, and my, my wife did help her a little bit. And so I have a, a stuffy for the uh, pint size protector of Richneck Elementary School for wh whoever that child was that was mentioned by the lawyer. I don't know who they are. And if you feel competent enough, I will happily give this to you to give to them. And if not, maybe someone here can help. Thank you. Can we pass that? Thank you. Do tell your daughter and wife thank you. Valerie Fashion, I think I usually call you fashion, but I think I, it is fashion. Yes. I was, I've been saying it right all along. Yes, just like a song, just like a spell. Uh, good evening, Dr. Mitchell and school board members. My name is Valerie Fashion, and I'm here tonight to advocate for my grandchild and the other children attending Richneck Elementary School. I wish Miss um, Abigail Zinra also a speedy recovery. <laughs> recovery. I'm concerned about the instructions that the students missed at Richneck Elementary School during the three weeks they were out of school because of the January 6th shooting. When will the winter growth assessment and benchmark assessments be administered to the Richneck students? The following growth assessments and benchmark assessments were not given. Reading, math, science, and social studies. What plans does the board have for catching up these students academically? Hundreds of Newport News students are not reading on their grade level. Hundreds of students do not know their multiplication tables. Hundreds of students cannot spell sight words correctly. Education is the new currency of the 21st century. Learning how to spell words correctly is crucial to being successful in the United States of America. I am concerned about the challenges the students are having because they are below their grade level. Everyone on this school board is an elected official and is your, it is your fiduciary duty to make sure all students attending the Newport News Public Schools receive top-notch edu top education. It is also your duty to respond to our constituents when they have requested information concerning your educational programs. Non-responsive behavior is unacceptable. Please make sure, please make educating our children a priority. Also, many of the students in Newport News are struggling to gain a top-notch top education because Newport News public school system, especially on the elementary level, is using a textbook list curriculum. <clears throat> Copies of paperwork are being used from websites on the internet. Newport News has a broken educational system the paperwork are not the same at all of the elementary school that's being given to the children. And I feel as if they're not, the school system is not doing their best in order to educate our children. Without an education, they're not going to be successful. Thank you for your time. Dr. James Graves. Um, let's see, the next person I have is Irene, I think it's D Delif, yes. Hi, Irene. Hi, I'm as nervous as anybody could be. But I was born in Newport News. I went to Hydenwood Elementary. I went to Newport News Intermediate, and I graduated from Ferguson in 1975. And if you can't do your math, I'm 65 years old, and I'm still working here. See, Dr. Park. Parker asked us to keep teaching after we had gone through so many years and that's why I'm here I persevered I persevered with Dr. Mitchell thank you Dr. Mitchell she's wonderful she's led our department in a, in a superior way listen to what she's got to say 
She helped us in every, in every way she could for all the special needs kids. You see, I'm a special education teacher at Saunders Elementary now. And I want to tell you also, I was the bus coordinator for the school until recently. Um, it's a challenge to be the bus coordinator. Three rows of cars are coming at me because they only pick up their kids. All the buses are coming right up the line. And you're not going to believe it. Walking backwards, I tripped over a cone. But I persevered. I knew there weren't any substitutes. And they'd asked us to get all three administrators acknowledged before we took off. So I waited. I waited. I went to the doctor and he said, um, let's do a physical for you. And when I took the physical, he said, raise your hands above your head. You see, I can't raise my left hand anymore. I have a torn rotate, rotator cuff. I have ligaments and tendons that are messed up. I did submit it into Workman's Comp, and that's what I'm here to talk to you about. I want to tell you about the system of Workman's Comp here in Newport News. I, did, I, I was honest about everything, and I went to the doctor. I went to uh, two orthopedic surgeons, got two opinions, and I have a torn rot rotator cuff no matter what. Can't have physical therapy because it's torn. Actually, it's fringed. That's on March 3rd. I will have a surgery. I'm using my own insurance. But I don't sleep well at night. I can't. I can't lay in the bed. My poor husband, I feel so sorry for him. He has to put up with me in the bed. And I thrash around every night. I wake up three and four times a night. It hurts. It really hurts, guys. I know there's no substitutes. So, and I, and I feel sorry about the situation. But I've persevered all this time, and I'm going to continue. Um, after going to the um, orthopedic doctor, on over 18th, I was hit by a student. I'm, like I said, I'm a special educator. Things happen. I didn't duck. But I did raise my right arm and tore my rotator cuff even more. I'm in pain, and I want you to know that. But I never stopped coming to school. I never stopped teaching. You asked my administrators. I never stopped. And I'm sorry, but I'm tired. I'm tired of the pain. I went to school at Hydenwood. And you know what they used to do at Hydenwood Elementary? They started off the day with Bible reading and prayer. Oh, you're going to shut me off? That's OK. I want to tell you where, where we need to be, and that's God. We need to put God back into the system. He was there. He's been there. He's there now when I get there in the morning. Thank you. Oh, by the way, thank you. And listen, she's wonderful. Thank you. Ronchelle Williams, Ronchelle Williams, hello. Good evening to everyone. Um, I'm here today on behalf of Firm Foundation Mentoring. Um, we are a 501c3 organization here in Newport News, and we provide mentoring services to youth ages 8 to 18. We're a fairly new organization, um, but we've seen good success um, in a church setting. Um, let me just say, I, I don't need to remind you of the challenges that are facing our youth, our students, our faculty, our teachers. Um, everyone here is well aware of what is at stake. Um, and no school is immune to violence, you know? And I think a lot of folks are afraid of what, what school is next. Um, so what I'm saying is, Mentoring is one solution. I'm not saying it's a catch-all. It's not going to solve everything. But um, mentoring works. Kids who have caring adults feel seen and supported, which means they are less likely to self-harm. They're less likely to harm others, less likely to miss school days, and are able to see a brighter future for themselves. A child who believes in their future is not going to ruin it with poor actions today. So from Foundation, Mentoring works because we use evidence-based practices. And we also incorporate CBT, which is a therapeutic treatment um, type of method that you can do. And we do believe that what we, what we do works. So I'm here today to introduce you to who we are and find support from the school board to launch this program in a, in a middle school in Newport News. So I'm looking at you, Dr. Best. I'm looking at you, Ms. Alger, as the South District. I'd like to start there. So I'll be looking forward to speaking to each of you after this. And thank you for your time. Okay. 
Laura Nelson Rogers. Good evening. Hello. Hi. Um, I'm a current teacher in Newport News Public Schools. I've been teaching in Newport News Public Schools since 2004. I'm the parent of a current Newport News te uh, student. He's a freshman in high school. And I'm the parent of a former Newport News student. We used to live in Newport News, but we had to move because Newport News failed my youngest child with special needs. There's a number of people in this room that <clears throat> I had to pull in last year to advocate for my child. He happens to be double exceptional. He's in a TAG program. He also had an IEP. You don't have services for him in Newport News. I had to make the choice as a parent, do I put him in classes to challenge him? And then I know he doesn't get his services? Or do I put him in classes that he isn't challenged? There's literally no place in Newport News that you have for him. So I come to you tonight to talk to you about what can you do to better support our students with special needs and your classroom teachers? Because you failed my child and you failed his teachers. There was no plan for him. I can relate to the struggle of those rich neck parents and students in the classroom. I had to pay my own money to have my child evaluated. I paid my own money to send my child to a child psychologist because my Newport News insurance didn't cover it. I fought for my child, which then resulted in us saying, the important news doesn't fit for him. I ask you to please ensure that the rules that you have in the Rules and Responsibility Handbook are enforced. Administrators don't suspend kids like they should. They're worried about attendance. As a teacher, I can't tell you how many times I've written a referral, where does it go? You need more special education teachers. There aren't enough. The reason that my youngest child didn't come to the middle school where I teach, we didn't have the support services for him. I knew that. I wasn't gonna put him in that situation or the teachers in my school in that situation. You need more teacher's aides. You need more guidance counselors. You need more mental health professionals. As a classroom teacher, you purchased this Rethink program. How am I qualified as a classroom teacher to teach social, emotional, and mental well-being to these students? Why is that my job? I came into this profession to teach content, and we do so much more. Please, Newport News, give those support services. Because I understand the trauma that our Newport News students who had to witness the gun violence feel. In 1998, I was in a school in Northern Virginia, and we had a student that was shot and killed in the classroom right outside where I was. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Frank Richardson. Good evening. Good evening. In light of the school shootings in 2021 and last month, I uh, went through some of the policies, guidance, uh, strategic plan, and I have some comments and recommendations. The first one relates to the policies and procedures manual, section B, school board governance and operations. The school board operational goals is the title. And in the, uh, uh, that guidance, it says the primary responsibility is to develop the school board to develop policies that will promote educational achievement for all children in the community. Given the light of the school shootings, I believe that every policy that you have based on what happened in last month should be reviewed to ensure safety and security is included in every policy that you have. And it has to be a foot stomper to ensure the parents, the teachers, and the students are safe to have a good learning environment. Based on that, you have your agenda. The uh, policies and procedures on that is the school board governance and operations exhibit as order of business. <coughs> Under agenda items, I recommend that school safety and security for staff, teachers, and students be a standing line item for discussion. 
You should have information about high schools, middle schools, elementary schools every month. If there were zero incidents, that's great. But every parent in this room needs to understand what's happening. What was the, the severe action, i.e. a shooting, which is pretty severe, all the way down to uh, somebody yelling at a teacher and not being uh, compliant and interfering with class operations. The third one I saw was Policy Procedures Manual Section C, General School Administration. And the exhibit is student, oh, I'm sorry, Superintendent Performance Standards and Definitions. The performance standard number four talks about organizational leadership and safety. Superintendent fosters safety and success of all teachers, staff, and students by supporting, managing, evaluating the division's organization, operations, and use of resources. That's just a general comment. Based on what happened in January, uh, based on my military experience, if I were a commander, incident like this happened, I'm uh, fired, period, I'm gone, which happened. However, the superintendent got f full compensation of 500000 I believe there should be some comment in here that says, based on the severity of the actions of lack of safety, then they need to be removed without compensation. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have time for two more cards in this interval. Um, Cindy Connell. Good evening. My name is Cindy Connell. I teach at Gildersleeve Middle School, and I have two children who are students in NNPS. Last month's board meeting saw a massive turnout. Parents and teachers came and spoke about the importance of listening to teachers, most specifically in light of the shooting of Abby Zwerner at Richneck Elementary School. The board instituted roundtable discussions in every school on January the 27th, saying that the voices of teachers were being heard and would continue to be heard. I led one such discussion in my building, taking more than seven pages of typed notes during the discussion. At that point in time, the eyes of the world were on us, most specifically the eyes of the media. Now a month has passed. Media coverage has waned. My question is, what is being done with the data that was collected at the January 27th roundtable? What specific changes are going to be made in NMPS so we don't just return to business as usual? As a teacher, I'm busy. I have two teenagers. I also adjunct at CNU. I want to feel like the board is handling the things that need to be handled without me reminding them to do so in a public forum. Unfortunately, I do not, hence my presence here again tonight. I'm not suggesting or even asking that you all solve every problem in a month. I'm simply asking for a little communication. Teachers are leaving the profession in droves. Teachers are leaving Newport News Public Schools in droves. I have written more reference letters for colleagues in the past two years than I have in my entire 20-year career. Until active steps are taken to listen to the voices of teachers and institute change, we are not solving this problem. We are merely bystanders watching it happen. I plead with you to help us all actively work together toward a solution. Thank you. I do hope that everybody has um, their um, time schedule this evening to remain for our um, monthly school update because we will be reviewing the findings from that uh, exercise that we had the entire dis division go through and recommendations. So th I'm glad we're on the same page. Uh, one more, and then I'm going to ask for a motion to extend, oh... I think we'll just extend for 30 minutes uh, after that. We probably won't need the full 30 minutes. If I can have Nicole Cook. Hi. Hello. I would like to thank the majority of the board for putting our school system above friendship and fraternity. Mr. Hunter. Last month, we had to listen to your thoughts for 17 minutes and 53 seconds. Tonight, I hope you will listen to mine for three minutes. First, I want to address the way you spoke to Mr. Dunham, a man whose son was killed at Minchville High School. 
Mr. Dunham thought he had an opportunity to speak, came up to this podium. As soon as he realized he could not speak, he sat back down. You replied, and you asked why our kids are bad. Wow. I wish my students acted like Mr. Dunham. He was respectful, kind, and very restrained considering the way you spoke to him. Later, you did apologize, saying you did not know who he was. Wow, again. A member of the school board did not recognize the father of a child who was killed at one of our schools. You also talked about the analogy of a bus. Students, teachers, bus drivers, custodians, cafeteria workers, and other building level staff and administrators are on that bus every day. We've been hanging out the windows begging for help as you and the superintendent and others have driven by in fancy cars. Every now and again, you do hop on the bus for a photo op, but never long enough to see those brakes that were squealing. We tried to get you to notice, but you were too busy looking at all the fancy data. We were filling out surveys about how unsafe our bus was. It seems you did not see them. I personally emailed you in December asking for help, but no reply. Perhaps you only got the hand-picked data that makes the bus look mechanically sound, even though it isn't. Or, as you did say, the bus was going downhill. I guess as long as it was moving, you thought it was okay. Sadly, the bus careened out of control and some really good people jumped out the emergency exit, but the rest of us stayed put battered, beaten, and exhausted, hoping to survive when the bus crashed. Well, on January 6th, the Newport News Public Schools bus crashed. Other members of the board were snapped back into reality. No more driving by and waving for them. At the last meeting, you suggest we wanted to switch drivers. No, we want a whole new bus, one that works to educate students and keep them safe. We do want you and other members of the board and central admin to be on the bus with us this time. But for some reason, when the people who are on the bus speak up with solutions to help make the bus better, those people in the cars are afraid, so they try to intimidate us. It happened to me after the last meeting. And I will gladly accept the retaliation and will not cower to intimidation, because a young man named Marshall Mathers taught me that we have one shot. And the opportunity to fix a system that is broken is only gonna come once in my lifetime. And we, the true experts who are on that bus every day, we're gonna own it. We are going to seize this moment and make our schools better. Okay. We just hope that you will also capture this moment and join us in making Newport News Public Schools better. Thank you. Okay, may I have a motion? We have an, a motion to extend our uh, comment time for 30 minutes. Uh, yes, Madam Chairman. I would like to make a motion to extend the public comments for 30 minutes. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Please call the roll. Yes. Four. Brown. Four. Harris. Four. Hunter. Four. Alger. Four. Amon. Four. Searles Law. Four. Motion carries seven zero. Thank you for the extension of time. Amy Lee. Good evening. I am Amy Lee, an educator here in Newport News. I, still new to Virginia, this is only my second year here, I contemplated whether to speak out this evening due to repercussions that may occur. However, I quickly changed my mind because I am a teacher advocate, and if I do not speak up, I am not doing what I am passionate about. In light of events in our district over the past two years, change needs to happen. Before I begin, this is not an indicator of any particular school, but rather a trend in this district. I understand that what I will speak on is not a new topic. Everyone also knows that change occurs over time and is only sometimes immediate. The students' behaviors that are present hinder learning for all students. Disruptive student behaviors associated with adverse outcomes, including poor grades, low achievement scores, lost teaching, teacher burnout, societal expenditures, and later on, dropout. The number of students with social and emotional behaviors has increased. Negative achievement has been found for all students, those with behaviors and those exposed to behaviors. <clears throat> Young learners with behavioral problems have more difficulty forming positive relationships with their teachers than children without behaviors. In turn, the teachers would have trouble developing 
positive relationships with their students because their classrooms would have multiple students with behavioral problems. Research suggests that aggression may encourage more aggression, which can be reduced with positive and supportive teacher-student interactions and positive student-to-student -student interactions. I am not speaking to the choir. All educators know this. However, what can be done about this? Asking teachers to do one more thing will continue to set teachers over the edge of what they are already feeling. Research shows that there are school-wide programs to assist and manage behaviors. However, more support is needed for the more extreme and consistent behaviors. With this said, it would be a disservice to add more to the teacher's plates. It takes everyone, and more so, a call out to the administration to remove disruptive behaviors. It takes parents to support the schools. It takes our district administration to help the building administrators, administrators and teachers. This is not a new problem. This is an ongoing problem. What are you doing to fix this? Hire more educators to support the students and teachers? Lobby for funding to have more resources? Is there even a plan? Thank you. Next is Ms. D. Um, that's me. This is D'Onofrio. Last time that was one to kind of trip over. So I'll have you just call me Miss D like my students do. Um, I was here last month and I spoke to you all and in that month I have done a lot. Um, first I would like to say uh, good evening to everyone and I would like to say thank you to Dr. Mitchell, to Mr. Brown, and to Mrs. Buffalo for actually returning the emails that I sent out to the school board because they were the only ones who could manage to give me a reply. So thank you for that. Um, I am still awaiting answers but your ability to communicate is appreciated. And last year, I watched over some of the videos from last year in October, where I noticed that Dr. Mitchell had planning and organization for the community last year that was far better than anything this board has provided us with thus far this year. There are many year words I will use while speaking tonight, but there is one word I will not use, and I think it demands consideration in this discussion. There is no word for a parent who loses a child. I apologize in advance if I go a tad over my three minutes, but after waiting hours to speak last month, I wasn't heard. So I'm taking those three minutes back and we'll try it again. The Newport News Public School Board is here to serve this community and to answer this community. So, Let's remember that it is not the other way around. I am not here to impress anyone. I am not here to make friends. I am here to advocate for my children, my students, my coworkers, the teachers and children of this community. This is not the Grammys. This is a community in crisis, concerned for the welfare of the children and educators in our public schools. And I urge you, to listen to the community you serve tonight and do not rush anyone off when it is their turn to speak. This is not a three minute per person conversation. And as I tell my children and students when warranted, put on your listening ears. It has been over a month since we last met, yet the same questions remain unanswered. The same problems still exist. And still, most of the board is failing to take the action called for, failing to create the boards that were asked for, failing to communicate with the educators and citizens of this community, to provide details and updates on the timeline of the installation of the metal detectors, or to let us know what will be done for our children and our schools while we wait for those to be put in place. In the meantime, the statements and actions that have been taken haven't lessened the amount of trust I have in the board from comments like, our children have learned a lesson, to this is not a Newport News problem, it's a gun problem, to the time is now in reference to putting metal detectors in, no, the time to put in metal detectors is before tragedy, not following foreseeable acts of violence committed on our school grounds. And while most, yes, this is a country that has gun addiction, this is most certainly a Newport News problem. 
you do not have to be the one pulling the trigger to bear responsibility. In the past month, all that I can see that has been done by the board is to give Dr. Parker a gratuitous severance of over half a million dollars, which quite frankly, not a single one of us at the last meeting asked for. And this was done in a closed board meeting. Specifically, I think, because you all know that the community did not want that. And why is it that we have $500,000 to pay a man who did not do his job, who did not follow the legislation that has been in place in this state since 2013? We had the ability to give him half a million dollars, but we don't have the ability to provide protection to our schools. We don't have ability to provide security to our schools. We don't have the money to pay our teachers when we're putting them on the front line. It is shameful. And yet, we have millions of dollars to put into unneeded security, replacing sec smart boards that were in working condition with millions of dollars in new smart boards. So in the past month, I have taken the time to do a lot of research Ms. D, that is six minutes at that point. Well, if you eat, read my emails, maybe you'll get more. If not, I'll be back next month, and I will keep going until everything is heard. And I would also like to say, it says in your school's information that elementary schools will get security when it's requested. I requested it last year in writing and in words. I requested it at the last meeting, and I demand it now. Put security at those schools. Pam Hall. Good evening. I'm Pam Hall and I live in the Southeast community. As a member of the Southeast community, I continue to represent the over 400 petitioners against moving Huntington Middle School from 3401 Orchid Avenue. If city council was so concerned about the education of the children, they should have done their part in 2018 and funded the request from the school board for a brand new school and it would have opened in 2022. Since the plans are incomplete, maybe we should revisit the Grimm and Parker design. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Marlon Pendergraft. Oh, hello. Hello. Uh, first off, I'd like to congratulate Ms. Alger on her appointment. Uh, also, I want to thank Mr. Brown and, and Ms. Amen for the kind words you guys said uh, a couple weeks ago um, in reference to the appointment and uh, giving me your vote. Uh, and thank you guys all for putting on the interview process and, and, and actually considering me. Um, I just wanted to take a few minutes to, to kind of talk about how this started for me, because in 2020 is when I decided to run when my daughter was bullied in these schools. Uh, we felt like our, me and my wife felt like our back was against the wall. We took her out of, uh, took her out of public school and put it in private. I ran again last year in 2022 because the schools got worse. And I still lost that election, and I'm going to continue to fight. And I ran on safety, discipline in our schools, giving our teachers a voice, giving our parents a voice, connecting the community back to the school system because I feel like that is the only way to make sure the schools are run appropriately is to bring those families back into our school system. So I'm asking you tonight to let me start a safety committee. And thank you, Frank, for what you said because you kind of stole my ideas. But uh, <laughs> I'm asking you to let me start the safety committee so we can get the public safety, we can get the school system, we can get the community together, get our heads wrapped around this thing, and we can solve this issue. I don't have all the answers for these safeties, but I'm a, I'm a fireman military before that so i have the credentials to do this so i'm asking you guys to let me start this i also promise to substitute once a month and friday will be my first day substituting so i'm excited for that so whoever it was in here that needed a substitute please give me a call <laughs> <laughs> i appreciate you so thank you uh for your time and I also want to know, uh, let you guys know I am announcing my intent to run for 2023 in the South District in a special election. Thank you. Thank you. 
Roderick Barnes. All right. Good evening. Um, greetings, school board members. I come to you with calm unity love. And my passion to have our babies ascend into what God made them to be. It's time for action. I urge you to promote opportunities for community to return back to the school building constructively. PACE and the PTSA should be instrumental in this effort. We have about 25 elementary schools in the district. Every single one of these schools need after school programs and opportunities. Organizations like Bridging the Gap Youth Programs, and there was another nonprofit that talked about mentoring. Um, can step in with proven programs. I'm currently volunteering with Bethlehem Judah Ministries Coalition at Newsom Park Elementary School. We have um, on Tuesdays after school. But we need to pay the people to implement these opportunities. Another issue is Saturdays. There should be opportunities and options for our youth to occupy them away from the streets. The Hampton Roads Youth Leadership Conference and Mentor Program is a part of that solution. We will have sessions once or twice a month for up to 100 children, 12 to 18, with youth and adult mentors. This is a regional effort that we solicit the support of Newport News. Finally, since home is not always the most productive place for our, um, to put it kindly, for our suspended children, we must have program, a program with curriculum, with a curriculum. Restorative justice is a good curriculum for that. You have an expert on staff. I'm hoping that we can work together you and the community to form calm unity. I spell calm unity with a capital U N T Y because it splits the word into its most important parts communication and unification. True communication will develop unification. It's okay to disagree, um, agree to disagree. Feel free to contact me. I've sent this email to all of you all and also the um, other than the new appointment and also the clerk feel free to call me or email me back because i'm here to help thank, thank you thanks. mr barnes <laughs> last card i have is for tamra wills at least that's the last card i think i have is there anybody else who um thought that they may have submitted a card and i did not call their name So, Tamara Wills, hello. Good evening, you all. I had a Zoom meeting at the same time. I'm feeding the homeless tomorrow at Four Oaks um, Training Center. Again, I, I, I'll come here and tell you, you all need to start bridging the gap. I said this last time I was here. I have emailed the school board. I also have had a meeting with the head of the PTA. She's here today. I also have also emailed face. So I've done all you all's procedure and I'm not getting any return information. I am a community leader that has been working in the community and I want to help the schools. You have a lot of parents and a lot of community people who want to help you all, but I'm not sure what is set up in the school systems that is blocking the parents and blocking the community out. Why? I don't know why. I've been trying to figure it out. 
because you all need the community. You need the parents. You need the people back in the schools to help you. You cannot control these students. Their parents need to be there. People need to be there to help you. And whatever you have, I, I don't know. I've been trying to figure it out just as a business owner. What is going on with why it's so hard for the community to be a part of what you all are doing? I understand it's called the school system. It's a business. I get it. But right now, you all are in need of desperate help to change things. You have teachers complaining. I'm on Facebook. I'm everywhere. I'm an influencer. I'm a promoter. I'm a head founder of a nonprofit organization. And I work very hard in the Nupa New City. And I'm trying to understand what is the disconnection. And the only thing that I can come up with is that you all are not bridging the gap. And you need to, we all need to start doing it. The different systems, the different programs that you all have set up have to start connecting. They're not connecting. It's a disconnection. And our children and our young people are suffering. I believe in meeting people where they are. Um, I heard a teacher talk about people driving by in their nice cars and all this stuff. It's the truth. Stop. It, has, it, it just has to stop because children are dying. Teachers are being shot now. So I'm trying to figure out what else is going to make us wake up and say, hey, we may need to put, you know, bring in the business, but we do need to bring in community. We need to bring in compassion. We need to bring in love. We need to bring in mental health. We need to bring in all these different things that can help change what is going on in your school system. Um, you all, I have a great campaign that can help Nupa News City change things. And I have emailed Dr. Bess, Ms. Law. I can name them. I've emailed everybody. So I'm waiting for an email. And get back with your head of the PTA. She can help you. I heard the PTA is the top person that can connect things. So I had the time to sit with her. I think that you all should do it too. Have a great evening. So I will just check and make sure we don't have any more cards for this section. Dr. Graves. Dr. Graves, are you ready? Okay, great. James Graves. Good evening. Good evening. Madam Chairperson, Vice Chair, Dr. Bess. What you're about to receive is a three-page essay, which I was not going to read in front of y'all today. But I want to say is this. We, the union, have a good relationship with the school board, the administration, and our teachers. This last month has been stressful to you all to myself as a union president, and to our union, to the fact that it put me in a hospital for three days. But the chair lady called me just like a big sister, how you doing? So we have a good relationship, and I appreciate that. I appreciate the administration, Mr. Wright, and some other administration folks who have called me at 9 o'clock at night when I called them. I want y'all to know this. Listen to what the people are saying. Listen to what the union is saying. And we can make things move forward. Um, I hope my doctor's not listening and looking at this thing, because he's going to get on me when I get back home. <laughs> but I wanted you to know this. I appreciate you. The union, Newport News Education Association, appreciate all of you. Keep up the good work. And we're going to move forward with the right direction. And we're going to just help all of our teachers get through all of this. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We'll now move on to Section 3, the Consent Agenda, which includes 3.01 minutes from the regular meeting on January 17, 2023. 3.02 minutes from the closed session on January 17, 2023. 3.03 .03 
minutes from the closed session on January 24, 2023, 3.04 minutes from the closed session on January 25, 2023, and 3.05 minutes from the closed session on January 31, 2023. We also have 3.06 financial reports, including the revenue report for January 2023, the expense report for January 2023, and the child nutrition reports for January 2023. 3.07, the personnel report. 3.08, appointment of deputy clerks. At this time, can we have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Uh, Madam Chair, I move to approve the consent agenda as presented. Okay, do I have a second? second? And is there discussion? Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Jackson. Four. Brown. Four. Harris. Four. Hunter. Four. Alger. Four. Amon. Four. Searles Law. Four. Motion carries seven zero. Thank you. And then the next item on our agenda is section four, action items. On the agenda this evening is 4.01, human resources benefits policies. We were presented a, um, given a presentation last board meeting. And so, um, do I have a motion? Uh, Madam Chair, I move to approve the HR benefits policies as presented. And do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Any discussion? The discussion that I will just uh, comment is thank you to the committee for going through the HR policies with our HR representatives. I, I know they were quite a few, so thank you so much. All right, please call the roll. Best. Four. Brown. Four. Harris. Four. Hunter. Four. Alger. Amen. Four. Searles Law. Four. Motion carries seven zero. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to item 5.02, Human Resources Benefits Policies. Um, do we have additional policies that we're going to have shared today? No, ma'am. That was just the only action item. We can go on to uh, 5.01, the monthly okay. school report. Okay, great. So we'll do 5.01, our school update report. Dr. Mitchell. Thank you very much, Ms. Searles Law. This evening we will share with you the results um, of the roundtable discussion and the survey. At this time, we are going to ask Dr. Crystal Haskins, who is our Director of Equity Assessment and Strategic Operations. She is going to share with you and the viewing public the results of the survey. Thank you, Dr. Haskins. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm gonna start with the survey plan. On January 26, all staff within our buildings met to discuss, safe, discuss safety in um, Newport News Public Schools. Teachers and staff met in small groups, um, and after the small groups, you all can see the four questions that are there. They discussed those, and then after the small groups, they met in whole groups, whole school, to discuss um, themes in seven buckets that I will go over. You all, it is so hard for me to stand at this podium and stand still, so I'm going to try not to, like, turn around because I feel like I'm back to you. Um, but anyway, all right, sorry. Um, so then the whole school met um, to discuss the seven buckets and themes that came within those seven buckets, and that was to get the collective voice. Um, of the district, and then I'm going to go into the methodologies of both surveys. But the process of having the conversation and dialogue within the roundtable discussion was used through the affinity pro process protocol. So survey methodologies, the two surveys, um, both were, you, both were um, used with SurveyMonkey to collect data. Then it was through Monkey Learn to do a qualitative analysis. Both had guiding questions and or guiding topics. The participation rate was extremely high with 1,300 participants. We have um, 1,310 staff that were, or faculty that were able to participate. We also have 1,800 support staff within Newport News Public Schools. So this is a very high rate considering who had access to um, internet at the time of the survey and by the closing date. 
So the data collection piece was mixed methods. We had a Likert rating, and then we had open-ended responses. The, um, the analysis consisted of thematic sentiments, opinions, and aspects. And I will say that the individual survey, yes, somebody mentioned the, um, the breadth of open-ended responses that were collected. It was so much data to collect. However, I do believe that it was because um, the school board actually wanted to get the response and did not want to put parameters on what people could offer to the um, analysis. With the round table piece, that was to collect collective thought and to have it within a school setting. So with the safety survey for the emergent themes and the individual survey, um, three topics came up very high. They were high frequency topics. Communication, communication, and communication. In the areas of clear communication, better communication, transparent communication, as it was related to the process and procedures. And then you will see as filtered by negative behavior, disruptive behavior, violent student behavior, stricter consequences, timely management, and accountability. And so on the side, you can see where the emergent themes, you have frustration as a sentiment and fear as a sentiment. And in the middle, um, they are in relation to un unmet expectations. In the individual survey, there was a quantitative piece where um, there was, we were trying to draw the distinction between division level efforts and school level efforts with safety. 72 respondents had favorable responses to school safety efforts in comparison to 25% favorable responses to district efforts. 58% of high school staff had favorable responses and were on par with division data regarding district efforts. 67% of respondents had favorable responses to schools' student safety efforts in comparison to 24% favor favorable responses to districts' efforts. So you can see in the first two um, questions that there is much more confidence in the safety efforts of the school versus the safety efforts of the district as a whole. However, um, I would be remiss if I did not mention that there is a significantly high rate of participants that neither agreed or disagreed. So 28% neither agreed or disagreed with district safety efforts, and 31% neither agreed or disagreed with district safety efforts, um, as it relates to student safety efforts. So then the last four questions are um, in response to very specific pieces that um, the division wanted to collect. So in regards to communication, what did communication look like? for safety measures to students and staff, that was 37%. How many um, of the division felt that they would benefit from a review of the Newport News Rights and Responsibilities Handbook? That was 56%. Then um, the effectiveness of random bag searches is 73%. And then the effectiveness of clear book bags as a safety precaution was 52%. So as we transition from the individual survey to the round table responses, you can see right here in this ranking that discipline and behavior um, was prominent. Um, next was communication, and then you see staff following that along with resources. And these are the seven buckets that I was mentioning um, that were the themes. Themes were, themes were devised from these buckets when there was a round table discussion. And then you can see how mental health supports Family engagement and culture and climate were trailing below, but what I want to bring to your attention is discipline and behavior and communication, and then we're going to unpack these buckets. So in communication, you have themes that came, but those themes are based on the frequency of responses um, and what we call like in this reduction process. So in communication, trusted system for voice and clear messaging and information equals comprehensive and consistent communication as being something in need. For staff and teachers, voice and behavior were expressed um, as it relates to and with the emergent theme of clarity, staff input, and support. And when I say voice, this is staff and teachers wanting to feel as if their voice is heard. Um, and behavior was, a, as you could see in the rankings of the buckets, was just a high topic and as it relates to clarity of messaging, staff input as it relates to voice, and then support of behavior. So for resources, um, as it relates to staff, human resources, and then support in knowledge and training um, and fiscal implications. And what I can say right here is that 
it is evident that division um, employees have an appreciation for what they do, but they want to make sure that they are doing the correct job, that they are um, working within their lines of responsibilities. And then with the emergent themes of human capital and pay increase. With discipline and behavior, zero tolerance came out a lot. Um, parents was a high level topic and then the SST process as it relates to accountability and responsibility. Culture and climate, visibility, communication in terms of um, being heard and feeling as if um, they are being listened to, and then support and the emergent themes being value and empowerment. With mental health supports, mental health training, um, additional staff, and the emergent themes being accountability, responsibility, and quality, and just to draw a distinction, um, because, and this was highlighted earlier in the presentation, because of the degree of behaviors in the regular classroom, um, there was requests, there was suggestions for mental health training, but then going back to the quality, not all of our teachers are trained in mental health, in the mental health profession. So wanting the quality of staff to deal with such behaviors. And then this visual right here is to show you the interconnectedness of the seven um, topics. And then when you take the individual survey along with the round table analysis, two main things came to surface and those are trust and safety. So from this um, analysis, and I'll say analyses because we are putting both of those and coming up with a narrative, the suggested actionable items are heightened security measures, informative and timely communication efforts, action oriented decision making, consistency in language and expectations, measures for accountability, revisit safety behavior structures and training, mental health initiatives and events, celebrations, and the counter narrative. And when I say counter narrative, making sure that as a division we are sharing the great positive and most beautiful things that this division has to share, um, increased visibility, collaborative and comprehensive communication structures, and transformational leadership practices. And now I will call up Mr. Richard Wright, Chief of Staff, and Mr. Rusty Fairhart, Chief Operations Officer. Right. Thank you, Dr. Haskins. Thank you for sharing the uh, data, and uh, thank you for that wonderful process. Uh, good evening, uh, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, school board members, Dr. Mitchell, my colleagues and community. Uh, very excited to share with everyone uh, our results, but not only just our results, but how we will respond um, to this, uh, to this uh, data process. I will be speaking in, in three areas, uh, education, uh, resources, and committees. And we've had a number of our community members to ask about how they can get involved. So I look forward to closing, sharing that information with you. Under education, Mr. Fairhart will come up later and share our timeline for our metal detector process, rollout, and implementation. Uh, wanted to share that our assistant principals and principals will be trained with our new metal detector system, and that will be in addition to our security officers who have already been trained, and those that continue to be hired will be trained on how to utilize the uh, metal detectors. Mr. Fairhart will give additional information when he comes up. We also will be touching base with a uh, school security uh, consultant to do an assessment of our buildings. As you know, we, we have buildings that have different entrances, and we wanna make sure the health, the health and safety of our you know, students and staff is our priority. So to have an assessment will allow us to look at soft and hard uh, potential threats. So we will be uh, undergoing that process to get feedback. Let's talk about resources. Um, and that's what everyone definitely wants to hear. I mentioned the um, metal detectors, which Mr. Fairhart will discuss. But also I wanted to point out that we started the school year uh, with seven of our pre-K and elementary schools that did not have a full-time security officer. By March 1st, uh, those schools, um, pre-K and elementary, uh, will have a dedicated security officer. By March 14th, our pre-K centers, all of our elementary schools, Point Option, Achievable Dream Middle School High School, and Booker T. Washington 
will have two dedicated security officers to man their schools. So we will no longer pull from the three at our middle school and six at our high schools to fill in and or to be called to support at our pre-K and elementary schools. So to repeat, by March 14th, we will have two individual security officers at those schools. So we're very excited about that. Also, it, with our partnership with the police department and Chief Drew, uh, we have an adopt an officer program where we're imploring our officers to stop by Thank you to Kathy Alexander, Child Nutrition Services. If our officers stop by, they can have lunch with our students, and we're going to take care of lunch. So we'll provide that menu for them so they can spend time. Also, thank you to Sheriff uh, Morgan. Um, our um, sheriff deputies will be visiting our schools at arrival and dismissal um, to be visible, and also to stop in and speak with our administrators and teachers and to provide support. Tomorrow we're going to have the first of a number of sessions to talk about our pre-K through five um, students that may be exhibiting some challenging behaviors. We've heard from our teachers that there are often some um, distractions to the school environment, but the deeper piece is we'd like to get to the bottom or the, get to the root cause around what may, may be causing some of our young people um, to not feel as settled in the classroom and to not be as engaged. And I think it's our responsibility to do a research approach and also uh, take a practitioner's approach on how we can help them when it comes to their behaviors. So we're dedicated to that, and that first meeting will be tomorrow. Um, down the road, uh, we would hope that we have an alternative setting for um, our young people, but the goal is to get them support and then to get them back in the traditional setting and back in a way where there's no distraction to the school environment. We're also looking at um, our continued work around adding school-based support specialists, and that's around support for the SST process, but also support around responding to challenging behaviors. And again, I mentioned that our community has asked about committees. We have three committees that we're launching, our Family Engagement Advisory Committee, our Rights and Responsibilities Advisory Committee, and as we heard someone ask earlier, our School Safety Advisory Committee. So that's already on our website, and we will be launching that information also tomorrow morning to, to all of our families. At this time, I'd like to ask Mr. Fairhart to come up and talk a bit about our metal detection system and also training, and then I will follow up with our timeline. Mr. Fairhart? Thank you, Mr. Wright. Good evening, Madam Chairman, Madam Vice Chairman, members of the board, Dr. Mitchell. Um, I'm going to share with you um, some of the technical aspects of our metal detectors or weapon detect detection systems, and I'm also going to share, I think, what everybody really wants to know is our timeline. Um, as you can see, uh, there's a visual of what our devices look like, basically two columns that our, our students and guests to our school buildings will walk through. Um, what makes them a metal uh, a weapons detection system versus a metal detector is our ability to set the threshold about what we can detect, um, how sensitive our devices are. Um, our devices have been set at a at a threshold recommended by the vendor and other um, as well as those utilized by other local school divisions and they are set at the administrative level so they will be the same at each of our school locations. Um, some of the value that we have we can operate um, our machines and provide uh, receive information on our cell phones um, those that have uh, access to the application it provides battery life information, uh, allows you to manage the alarms, um, be they visual or auditory, um, sends a malfunction notification. The devices come with a 10 hour um, battery, uh, rapid recharge of 60 minutes. Um, one of the great functions is the, the decreased false positives and that's due to our ability to establish the threshold. Um, that gets kids into the building and visitors into the building at a rapid pace and um, they're extremely portable. So our schools can use them inside, outside, at different locations in their buildings. If they have events, say a dance in the gym, they can take them to the gym and use them there for the evening. So um, time frame, we, have, uh, we currently have six systems on hand, um, three at the Heritage High School campus being used by Her uh, Huntington Middle School, and then we have two at Rich Neck Elementary School, and we have one that we're saving for deployment. Uh, we had five systems ship on Friday, February 10th, which we received in the school division last Friday the 17th. Uh, we have five additional units that will ship this week, and then the remaining should ship um, by the end of the month. So hopefully by the end of February, 
um, everything will be on the way. Uh, our operating budget proposal includes a request for resources for 12 additional units so we can um, address some of the schools that have multiple entry points. Again, have some reserves in case there's a malfunction and we can allow some flexibility um, for other areas within the school division such as Todd Stadium, maybe the Coliseum for graduation, etc. Um, Mr. Wright mentioned our deployment. Um, certainly, uh, we're training staff on March 10th, which is a Friday, and we hope to utilize and deploy uh, the metal detectors um, throughout the school division on Tuesday, March 14th. Of course, that's dependent upon us receiving the, the devices in a timely fashion. Um, should we have to pivot to um, a more phased in or staggered um, deployment, we're working closely with school leadership to identify schools, um, priority schools based on discipline infractions and incidents at those particular locations. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Mr. Wright, and he's going to talk about a timeline for some of our um, initiatives moving forward. Thank you, Mr. Fairhart. So just want to close and then ask, uh, ask if there are any questions and share our timeline. Uh, we are kicking off a, uh, we have ki already kicked off, excuse me, a discipline referral audit, uh, looking at our discipline referrals and that data. Uh, we're excited about a school security job fair this Saturday. Uh, we are, we've already started to hire, offer um, jobs to um, the 30 additional security officers to provide that second dedicated security officer to elementary schools. As Mr. Fairhart mentioned, our weapons detection uh, delivery process is underway. I mentioned the uh, making sure that our schools have that first security officer and, and there are training dates uh, for um, the weapons metal detection process. That's March 10th. Our full rollout is the 14th, having the second officer in place also by the 14th. Uh, the Rights and Respons uh, Responsibility Advisory Committee uh, will kick off next month and our Family Engagement and School Safety Advisory Committees will have meetings in March, April, May and June. And we'd like to repeat the process of getting feedback from our staff, teachers, and leaders at the end of the year to see where we've made progress and to see if uh, what we've implemented um, has made an impact. And then we will go into the summer preparing for a new school year uh, with the same process. At this time, I'd like to take any questions that we may have uh, from our board. And my colleagues can assist uh, where necessary. Ms. Haven. Um, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. I have a few questions, but I'll ask sure. one and then <laughs> others can go. Um, so I'll just go down. The, so the school security job fair, you know, I know there have been a lot of people that have wondered how they can help. And um, maybe there are some that are just learning about the school security security opportunities. What type of backgrounds are we looking for? Is there any place or anyone somebody could reach out to if say they can't make it to the job fair but they're interested absolutely obviously our contact will always be mrs farish and her team um, we are and, and this question was posed in workshop obviously military background um, background with law enforcement and security experience is uh, what we recommend and what we're really looking for to ensure the safety you know of our schools but uh, anyone can reach out to Human Resources to find out more. The job fair will be at Crittenden Middle School this Saturday from 9 to 12. And we've already, um, we've already been able to lock in our volunteers and those that are working. And many of us uh, on the uh, team will be stopping by to support. And we, we'd like to, to hire the rest of our security officers on Saturday. And of course, all that's pending uh, background checks and being processed through uh, Human Resources. Want to do one more? Okay, sure. <laughs> sure. Um, for those that are interested in participating in a committee, because there's three opportunities, will there be an email going out or there'll be something posted on the website? What should people look for? Who should they reach out to? All right, we're going to use uh, all of our um, avenues. It's already on the website. Um, Dr. Mitchell will be sharing the information <laughs> during her comments and her section. Uh, it'll be on Twitter and all of our social media sites, and we will be sending out a blast uh, tomorrow morning uh, to all of our families. So we will be inundating our community about these opportunities, and we're looking forward to uh, participation and support. Thank you. Ms. Alger? Yes, thank you. I just wanted to follow up on the whole idea of being safe, seen, and supported and just making sure that we have look fors that embrace the culture mm -hmm. of safety. So it goes beyond uh, metal detectors, 
um, Dr. Haskins' report was excellent as well. And making sure that we, the minute we walk in, we, we are safe, seen, and supported. So just uh, making sure that, that that big picture is there uh, so that um, we have full support. Signage is important, as you mentioned earlier, right. key, and we, we'd like to see that in our buildings more, communication, and also our response. That's you know, checking right. our doors and greeting individuals as they walk through the building is very key. And when making it comes to sure that. it's consistent and with high fidelity, that's, that's key. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sam, are you done on this end? Yeah. All right. No, I just want, just want to let you know, you know changing the culture and things that they just stopped at the top. It also starts at the bottom too, but nobody on the school board will direct an employee to do anything or say anything. It's against the law, right? So the only people who can do that is administration. Okay, so changing the culture starts at the top. Troubleshoot, verify, check, double check, right? Eventually it spreads. And eventually, as uh, my colleague said, when you walk into a place or into a school, everybody is talking or thinking the same language, safety. Okay, so I just want to make sure that's reiterated. It starts from the top. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Mr. Brown. <clears throat> I'm going to ask the, uh, the question because the, the slide begs the, begs the question where it says currently in progress the discipline uh, referral audit. So I'm going to ask the very pointed specific question of when, will, when do we expect the audit to be completed? So I'm going, to, I'm going to defer to Dr. Mitchell first, of course, and then I can follow up on uh, any other. We answer. expect the uh, actual data and the report to be finalized within the next two weeks. Okay. And part of the reason why I asked that question is because we have the uh, Rights and Responsibilities Advisory Committee that's going to be working. Mm -hmm. uh, I would, I'm, I'm hoping that, was, of course, we can time um, completion up with that committee's work. Uh, I don't want to, you know, um, put the cart before the horse. Mm -hmm. I understand that we're responding and saying that we're going to have a rights and responsibilities um, advisory committee. I do think that um, we should take our, I'm not going to say take our sweet time, but take time mm -hmm. to be very deliberate with revisions of the rights and responsibilities handbook um, rather than this does look to me like a very aggressive schedule to review what it, what, what is a very um, thick and a heady document. Mm -hmm. um, so I just want to make sure that we're setting ourselves up for success. Uh, and uh, that we'll be taking the time to uh, get the audit results and actually really uh, review that in sharpen pencils before we uh, work through the committee. Absolutely. And I think I would want to add that while we have dates for those committee meetings, there will be subcommittees that will also be working on other days. So there will be more than just a couple of meetings. We will have subgroups that will take on different portions of it as well. If I could just uh, one, 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 my one other comment would be going back to slide 16. Um, I'll make the, the comment of um, the police department having access to the cameras in, in the schools that um, that was a request to my understanding. We, uh, we had our, our planning meeting this summer, so that's been long in the works. That was the one request of Chief Drew when he came and briefed, to the, briefed the board uh, and gave his uh, assessment of our MOU at the end of the summer. And that was the one request that he made. We at the time mm -hmm. said that we needed. A, we knew we needed to work through the legal process, and it looks like we've done that. We've done uh, that, but that yes, I want to, I want to iterate for the public who's watching this as well that the police department's access to those cameras would only be in an emergency situation. If yes. you could clarify when the police department would have access to our cameras. Sure, sure. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Brown. I do want to say I thought I would have to bring up Ms. Uh, Dr. Haskins. I thought you were going to ask a quantitative methods uh, question earlier, so I was a bit <laughs> nervous. So we, we did work in the fall, and we were able to uh, add an addendum to our MOU. It's an uh, operating procedure that speaks to only when there's an emergency and a challenge around the health and safety of our students would there be access to our internal or external cameras, meaning working with our technology department, and if an emergency happens, then we would press a button of sorts, and they would gain access. This is not a day-to-day uh, review of our camera system because that would violate FERPA. So we did that work. We were supported by Madam uh, Madam Chair, and we, we appreciate that. So that's underway. Yes. And Mr. Wright, if I may, would you also touch on the opportunity for the police department and the sheriff's department to have access? 
with the to Access get into card. the school. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Yes. So we we've also started the process of providing our sheriff's department and. Um, Newport News Police Department key card access to our doors. Mm -hmm. So if there's an emergency, in the past, obviously they're having to knock on the door mm -hmm. or gain access. Uh, and the we our SROs and our deputies and the supervisors would have key card access where they could uh, use that key card and get into the building. Of course, we don't Thank we don't want to see those uh, situations anymore. And into the classrooms. And into the classrooms. Yes. Miss Amon, did you have? Yes. <laughs> um, is there any timeline for the alternative program development? Like that, what that process looks like? I, I'm smiling, but I, I will. I will say that Dr. Mitchell and I had this conversation two years ago, and yes, we, we, did. we were we were talking to colleagues around the state and nationally about about this. But to answer your question, Mrs. Amon, as soon as possible, uh, we've we've already identified a location. Um, we know the uh, FTEs and personnel that we need to make this happen. Um, so we're, we're going to work very hard, very fast uh, for sake of the, the safety of our school division, but also to get to the root cause of what's causing challenging behaviors that uh, prevent students from learning. That's, that's the big piece. And I think that we can go on record to say this is not something that will we will wait for next year. It is our intention to implement this program that's right. this year. Yes, yes it is. And I, and I can provide a follow-up. That would, that would make sense maybe great. next month uh, to provide a follow-up on where we are. We would like that. Thank okay. You. Great. Right. Any other questions? So it's always nice to have the other board members ask their questions because I get to check my list off. Um, the one that I have remaining, uh, I guess, really is directed um, to Dr. Mitchell. One of the things that I know all of the board members have been fielding emails, long conversations on phones, meeting in person, talking about one of the root causes in our division and its communication. Uh, and so, Dr. Mitchell, can you just share some of the areas that we are going to be focusing on to improve our communication? Yes, so we, we have heard the staff members who have indicated that there is an issue with communication. As Dr. Haskins looked at the feedback, it's clear that the areas that we need to focus on immediately are creating a clear and consistent communication plan. So we are meeting this week to actually look at what that plan could look like. We are not, um, or I will speak for myself, I am not naive to think that every school gets the exact same communication from central office at the same time. Um, I am not naive to think that every department up here at central office is communicating smoothly and flawlessly. So we, we will be working on communication within this building, but we also will be working on a plan to how does the communication come from central office into your school and ensuring that it goes from your building leaders to you in a timely manner. So that plan we are working on as we speak. As you noticed in the um, report that Dr. Haskins shared, the security was number one in terms of student behavior, and then communication was number two. So we went, you know, and I believe some individuals that came up and spoke tonight said, we know you can't fix everything overnight. We have to take it in pieces. So we tried to approach the safety piece first and then we're gonna approach the communication and that is on our list for this week. Um, one of the things that you will find that you will receive from me are direct emails from your interim superintendent. So I will be sending you out kind of a little blurb on where we are with our communi communication plan and what it will look like. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? And I know there might be a question or two or comment from um, our uh, visitors today. There will be another opportunity to speak um, at the end. Can I add one more second? Yes, absolutely. I do want to add that one of the things that we, we were able to glean from the survey was the desire for there to be more visibility from central office. And I will go on record to say you will see more central office individuals in your schools 
um, having conversations with you and not there just for learning walks. Um, I am, um, I was able to, and since I've been in this role effective February 1st, <laughs> I've been to Woodside, Passage, Stony Run, Warwick, Hydenwood, and Minchfield High School. I am not coming in there to look to see if instruction is good. That is not my role right now. I know instruction is good in our buildings. I know what kind of staff we have. I wanted to hear from teachers. Yes, we had the, the data, but I wanted to hear from teachers. What are you looking for in a communication plan? What is it that you're concerned about for safety? So you will continue to see not only myself, but you will see others from central office in your buildings to have those type of conversations. We will move on to item 5.02, Human Resources Benefits Policies. And at this time, uh, Nina Farish, our Director of Human Resources, and Kim Hammond, our Coordinator for Human Resources Training and Development, will come and talk to you about the Human Resources Update. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chair Searles Law, Vice Chair Dr. Bess, Board Members, and Dr. Mitchell. This evening, we are going to share information regarding human resources annual recruitment, incentive, and retention initiatives. I am here with Kim Hammond, the HR Training and Development Coordinator. We will co-present, and Ms. Hammond will present to you many programs that she oversees in human resources for staffing and recruitment. Recruitment and retention comes under our strategic goal stewardship of resources. We strive to establish processes and procedures to recruit, hire, reward, and retain highly effective staff, all directed toward helping our students become college, career, and citizen ready. There is no surprise that we are facing some challenges with staffing. Here we have a comparison from previous years of teacher vacancies at, the at this time in, of the, each school year. At this point, based on 1,754.9 teacher allocations for the 22-23 school year, we only have 91.28% of the classrooms filled with licensed teachers. The remainder of the classes are being supported with instructional supports to include interventionists, instructional technology coaches, long-term substitutes, instructional assistants, and virtual contract services. We will have student count for the 23-24 school year by the end of March. We will then establish the allocated instructional needs and actual vacancies for 23-24. The number of vacancies would change, of course, based on that student count. An update of those actual vacancies will then be shared with you all. Taking a look at our resignations and retirements, again, 22-23 data as of today, our intent re process um, notifying us from staff of their intent to return or not ends February 28th. Based on some of the intents we have already received, we anticipate having the highest number of retirements that we've had in the past three school years. We, I, later in my presentation, I do have a proposal for the school board that we hope will entice some of these retirees who've put their intent, but they have not formally signed their paperwork. We hope that these proposals will maybe make them have a second thought. At this time, Ms. Hammond is going to come forward and talk about some of our Grow Your Own initiatives. Good evening. On this slide, you're gonna see our university partners where future teachers are working on the requirements to become fully licensed. I'm excited to share with you that this year we do have 94 student teachers and we have 235 practicum students and student observers. 58 elementary student teachers and there are 36 secondary student teachers who are learning from our master teachers and engaging with our students. Our practicum and student observers will have dedicated over 5,000 hours in our classrooms by May. We are very proud to host almost all of CNU's student teachers and we hire between 40 to 45 percent of them yearly. 
Data and research show that there has been and will continue to be decreases in enrollment in traditional educational preparation programs. In January of 2022, to combat these decreases, the Virginia Department of Teacher Education and Licensure formed a Recruitment and Retention Advisory Board with representation from key stakeholders across all eight superintendent regions. I am proud to be a member of this advisory committee. The committee's goals are to reduce barriers for qualified individuals to enter into the profession, to increase the number of candidates eligible to fulfill public school division hard to staff positions, and then strengthen strategies to recruit and retain a diverse, highly qualified educator workforce. Grow your own teacher in residency program. One of our strategies that we use is to grow our own teachers by the teacher in residency program. This year we have 14 residents, or I, I usually call them our TIRs. We have established the teacher in residency programs with ODU, CNU, and William & Mary. We collaborate with these universities to provide scholarships for master degree programs and a year-long paid internship for resident teachers. After completing the master's degree and their residency, they are fully licensed and then they commit to teaching with us for three years. As the state makes licensure policy more flexible, we will continue to increase Grow Your Own programs. For example, in November, VDOE awarded $143,000 in grant funds to nine universities to develop the teacher apprentice residency programs. Both ODU and William & Mary received planning grants to improve and expand residencies with Newport News Public Schools. And I'll repeat, ODU and William & Mary selected us. ODU received 20,000, William and Mary received 16,000 to continue our residency model and transition into an apprenticeship model. Representatives of the Virginia Department of Education and Virginia Department of Labor and Industry signed an agreement in January approving VDOE's application to create a registered teacher apprenticeship program in the Commonwealth. We are in the process of writing a grant, up to $200,000, um, to grow our own teachers. We are in the process of writing this grant, and additionally, we will receive priority for our program because we are part of this planning grant with both of those universities. So that opens up almost $5 million worth additional federal funds to our division to train and to um, recruit future teachers. Virginia's newly approved program is one of only a handful of teacher apprenticeship programs nationwide that meets the U.S. Department of Labor and Industry standards and are eligible for funding through several federal workforce development grants. And as you know, we are already leading this charge because we have four other apprenticeships in our division that I'll talk to you a little bit in a few. So teacher pipeline. The funding that William & Mary received, we are going to host a teacher pipeline summit for the peninsula in collaboration with Hampton City Schools, William & Mary, and Newport News Public Schools. The summit's going to examine reimagining the teacher pipeline on the peninsula. The summit's going to bring together a diverse group of leaders from multiple levels and organizations to discuss the teacher shortage on the peninsula and create approaches to recruiting and retaining highly skilled teachers. Emerging teachers. We continue to work with our instructional assistants, our substitutes, Newport News employees who have bachelor's degree, and now some who are working on their bachelor's who want to become teachers. We provide practicum placements, observation hours, tuition reimbursement, flexible placement that support them during their programs. We hosted our first Pathway to Licensure event in November of 2022, where our Newport News employees and community members were able to meet with our university partners to find affordable ways to obtain licensure. Emerging teacher programs also include current employees who go through a career switcher program with ODU or Regent University. When they qualify, we pay for the participants tuition and fees in exchange for a commitment to work with us for four years. We also continue to think outside the box. 
We have more provisionally licensed teachers than ever before. In 2015, there were only 117 provisionally licensed teachers in Virginia. Now it's over 3,000. We are waiting for VDOE approval for an alternative path to licensure. This path is not a shortcut to licensure. It does not bypass any state licensure standards. Our Provisional Licensure Academy of Newport News teachers, I like to call it PLANT, will contain professional learning designed by the Code of Virginia that combines the convenience of an online learning with the support of face-to-face -face mentorship and its competency-based education preparation program. I look forward to talking more about that once it is approved. To reduce barriers and to increase the number of eligible candidates, we also offer assistance with the Praxis Assessment. We are now partnering with 240 Tutoring. 240 Tutoring equips teachers with a quality comprehensive study resource and test simple simulations. We want to get teachers certified faster so that we can get them into the classroom to reach their full potential as educators. We will be implementing a tiered approach to provide this resource for free. Tier one, those who need the praxis to obtain licensure by June 2023. Tier two, those who need the praxis to obtain a provisional license by June of 23. And then tier three, those who are our current employees who want to be employed as teachers next year. Also, because we are partnering with 240, our employees will be offered a deep discount if they're not one of those first tier threes that we are going to offer it for free. Smart start for new teachers. When we hire new teachers, we partner with Curriculum and Instruction to provide the New Teacher Institute for Novice Teachers. New teacher welcome webinars where new teachers meet with specialists and coaches in their content grade level. And then during the new teacher welcome week, our new teachers start a week before their contracted start date. They receive assistance in curriculum, other professional development, and they have a technology session and a human resources session. We also provide trained mentors and teacher coaches for additional support. We resolve to remove barriers, increase the number of candidates that we have, and to strengthen our strategies to retain and recruit. Thank you. Further recruitment efforts continue our ongoing partnership with Troops for Teachers. This helps service members and veterans become certified and employed as teachers in the K-12 schools. This is a short list of recruitment plans as of today for February and March. We have a total of approximately 80 events we are participating in for teacher recruitment. Additionally, we hold our own events such as teacher walk-ins, which we are conducting also in February and March, and our own NNPS um, sponsored job fairs. Last year when I came before you, I told you we were exploring international recruitment. Well, we have now officially become a sponsor for international candidates. We have many candidates when we go to job fairs who come and they have visas and they need someone to sponsor them. We are now in a position that we can do that. And we're working with the Virginia Department of Education to also work with them as we do any of our other teachers and helping them to become licensed or to um, get their license that they have from their countries to be licensed here in the state of Virginia while we also sponsor them under their work visas. Additional good news I'd like to share. If you see this chart, last year at this time we were faced with 95 bus driver openings. We've brought that down this year to 76. We had 10 bus assistant openings. We now have three. We had five nurses that we needed. We now have two. We had 42 child nutrition employee vacancies. We now have seven. So we have made a lot of strides with our support staff being able to fill these vacancies. We will continue with the $2,000 sign-on bonus for bus drivers. In addition, we will continue with the $3,000 employee referral of a bus driver who becomes contracted. And at this time, Ms. Hammond's gonna talk about our apprenticeship program. 
So our Newport News apprenticeship programs, an effort to retain a quality workplace retention efforts for support staff, we include four apprenticeship programs. We have them in child nutrition, transportation, custodial services, and clerical. An NPS apprenticeship program is structured training program designed to develop highly skilled employees and no cost to our employees. The program combines quality hands-on career training and then the practical classroom instruction. Once the apprentice completes the two-year program, the skills learned in these programs equip the staff to be ready for the next level of advancement um, in their prospective areas. To date, we've had 170 employees participate and we've had 102 to graduate. Some of our recruitment strategies, we use TV commercials, we stream, radio, social media, uh, virtual career events, and job boards. At this time, I'd like to propose to the board in terms of helping with retention. I'd like to note that this is not inclusive. These are just some of the critical areas that we want to pre present. Additionally, we are seeking grant funding for the retention bonuses. On this slide, we are proposing a teacher retention bonus using the step range. We are recommending the bonus amounts shown. And as you can see, they range from $1,000 to $5,000 um, for our 21 plus um, step teachers. This is where we hope that some of those teachers who are have in, put their intent to retire, hopefully this will be an enticement for them to stay and not sign that paperwork. Additionally, we are proposing a retention bonus for bus drivers, if approved in the amounts of $2,000 up to $5,000. If approved, we will then come back with the particulars and details of what that looks like. We also are support, uh, proposing some increases for substitutes and some new categories. Our substitutes, many of our long-term substitutes have been very helpful for us in the classrooms. And as you can see here, um, we are proposing for degree teachers to increase by $10, the non-degree to increase by um, $10. The degreed long-term subs we are <coughs> proposing to stay the same. The following categories you'll notice that current it says NA because we do we have not had these categories broken out before. Some may think it looks a little strange that you have long-term subs that are licensed but actually we do and some may say well why aren't they contracted teachers. Actually some of our subs enjoy being subs because of the flexibility that it offers them for their family. So we actually do have licensed long-term subs. And because of that, we thought it would make sense to us to recognize them in terms of the rate also and the work that they are doing for us in covering many of our classes. Also, we are proposing um, some increases for some other areas where we've seen some struggles in getting staff for the instructional assistance. Um, again, these are substitutes, media assistant substitutes, substitute secretaries, substitute secretaries that have CIS certification, so they have knowledge of our student information system. And also our contracted instructional assistants, not substitutes, they currently also step up for us and they will cover classes when teachers are absent or out. Um, for appointments or long term sometimes and currently we pay them four dollars and fifty cents an hour more on their top of their normal pay. We are proposing to increase that to five dollars an hour. We continue also to discuss other options and initiatives. I hope to be before you in the coming months with some additional incentives that we are still discussing and working out some particulars. At this time, I want to thank the human resources staff for all of their hard work and their dedication, and we will entertain any questions at this time. Okay, Dr. Best. Okay, I would like to commend you for a very thorough and positive um, report. I, I love the good news and. and Happy about that and the Thank you. retention bonuses, the signing, uh, try to entice the people out of retirement, all that kind of stuff. 
um, excited about the partnerships um, with the schools where we're trying to um, build the empty slots for teachers that are in training and, and getting their certification. So I kind of have two questions for you. What are the number one barriers for people that are um, degreed but not certified? What's kind of the, what do you see as the number one barriers? And could you tell us a little bit maybe, and you probably answer a little, what are you doing to help them? And then number two, what kind of dialogue are you having with Norfolk State and Hampton University as well? Fantastic. Some of the barriers that they exist is they cannot go back to school. They are busy working, taking care of their families. Also the praxis, some of them struggle. So who I'm targeting to assist are people who are spending hours and hours and have years of experience working for our division, but just haven't found the opportunity to complete those licensure requirements. Um, secondly, um, with the apprenticeship grant, I believe it opens the door for Norfolk State and Hampton University. When we have talked, it has been that they graduate four years and some of them with education degrees, but have not completed their student teaching. So think about, and I, I've already, one of my former students was at Norfolk State, I got him in substituting. He comes to mind because his senior year, we can get him substituting or doing an apprenticeship track. And so then the following year, he would complete his licensure and come back and teach with us. So I'm hoping that the apprenticeship opens even more doors of opportunity. Thank you. Great. Mr. Brown? Yeah. So <clears throat> I too, I appreciated the report, particularly um, slide three where we're showing the uh, retirements and res resignations over multiple years so we can get an accurate comparison of what the trend is. Uh, but my question goes to, um, I have two questions going to pertain to slides 15 and 16. <clears throat> so on um, slide 15, the retention bonuses for the teachers, what is, how much is it, how much is that? And slide 16, the proposed retention bonuses for the bus drivers, how much is that? So I will defer to Ms. Minto if we have that figure at this time. If not, we will get you those figures. So, com so combined together, $6 million. Is that your last question? Yes. Mr. Brown? Yes, thank you. Okay. <laughs> That's fine. Ms. Zaman. Thank you. And thank you. It's, I'm, I'm very curious and encouraged by the apprenticeship program. So it's going to be neat to see how that rolls out. Um, so good information. Um, I had I had two questions. Um, we'll do this one here, and then we can bounce back. Um, is there, I'm just curious, because we seem to have more openings in teachers and in bus drivers, although we've worked hard to do both. Why are we starting the teacher retention bonuses for those one to five years at a thousand and then to five versus the bus drivers or two to five? What the rationale is for that? And then the, um, the comparison of the retirements and that sort of thing. Um, 2022, 2023, say for example, we have 35 resignations. Last year we had 279. 279, was that for the entire year, or did we have 279 resignations as of like February of last year? That's yeah. I'm thinking it's, I'm thinking 2022, 23 is year to date, and then the other years were kind of once that fiscal year was all done. So under the resignations, correct. Yeah, and I guess the same for retirements, but resignations was a bigger shift. Correct, so that was as of the close of the school year, whereas the 22-23 data is it's as just of today. right now. Okay. Correct. Thank you. And yes. then the question on the bonuses. To answer your other question, we are actually open in terms of because this is a proposal, if we are able to do more. So this was just right now based upon looking at some funding and numbers. Again, um, we are seeking grant funding. So we are certainly open to doing more for retention bonuses. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> and I just uh, wanted some clarification. Um, so it's 153 open positions currently, is that correct? Yes, ma'am, that is correct. And so how many teachers have provisional license? That is a good question. I can get you that answer. I do not have that present. Okay, okay. Um, and so, I'd, I'd like to see the combination of both just to kind of see what, right. 
Absolutely. Um, in terms of impact. Absolutely. That's critical. The other thing, too, I have a question in terms of the um, interstate licensure uh, teacher compact and in terms of, uh, I think there's a national trend uh, happening where there's reciprocity uh, and uh, where folks are just getting on board and it's just uh, current legislation that's happening. And so, um, in other words, uh, so if there's a license that you have, you can teach within all these different states. And so that's something that I would encourage folks to uh, speak to the Virginia Department of Ed uh, Education about uh, because that needs to happen uh, for sure. We need to have the ability to hire people from different states and not have mm -hmm. to worry uh, in terms of just rights. And so, I yeah. worked at one of the <clears throat> conferences, we were told that Virginia does honor and have reciprocity with all other states. Mm -hmm. Now what will come back is if that state did not require something in their undergraduate degree, so they have reciprocity, but then they have to maybe take a class. Mm -hmm. And so if they are interested, they can contact us and we will be happy to help them. Okay. okay. Anyone else? Thank you both. We really appreciate your Thank thorough you. Thank um, you, presentation. We'll move on to item 5.03, the FY2224. Proposed school year calendar. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chairman, <coughs> Madam Vice Chairman, members of the board, and Dr. Mitchell. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to highlight, to provide highlights from the division-wide calendar being proposed for next school year. But before I review the calendar and for the sake of the viewing audience, I would like to speak briefly about the team that developed the draft calendar, the process we use, and the factors that we considered in planning the calendar that is before you this evening. Now the draft calendar is the result of the work of the calendar committee, and that consists of elementary and secondary teachers, administrators, parents, representatives from our instructional areas, and our support services who provided valuable input on the draft, and they'll continue to work on the draft over the next several weeks um, to revise the calendar as needed. And I'd like to take the opportunity to thank the committee members for their hard work and really <coughs> striving to to create a balance with all of the various demands that we're facing and trying to provide a calendar that best meets the needs of our students, our staff, and our families. Now this slide shows our calendar planning process, which began with meetings with the six school divisions on the peninsula last fall. We incorporated their recommendations along with the input we received from our own calendar committee to develop the draft that I will be sharing with you this evening. Now we've posted the draft on our school division's webpage for public feedback, and we'll continue to reach out to the PTA and to our employee, student, and community advisory groups for their input through March when the calendar will come back before the school board for approval. Now there are several factors that we considered in planning the calendar. First and foremost is our instructional program. So we develop a calendar to, to support our work in preparing our students to be college career and citizen ready. So with that as our guide, we determine our marking periods, our teacher work days, our teacher planning days, our family conference times, our staff development days, our winter and spring breaks, and our holiday observances. Then we base the calendar on the state requirement of a minimum of 990 instructional hours per year, which we will exceed, especially given up to 10 inclement weather days can now be counted as virtual learning days since we provide a device for every student. Now, once we had our student days in place, we added teacher work days, 
planning days and opportunities for professional development for up to 200 days for teachers as required by the state code. And lastly, we work within a 245 day contract or appointment period for our 12 month employees. Now, this current school year was the first time in over a decade that Peninsula School Divisions opened with different start dates. However, next school year, we will all open pre-Labor Day on Monday, August 28th, according to the drafts that our neighboring school divisions have shared with us thus far. And just as a reminder, under state law, school divisions that open prior to Labor Day also close schools on the Friday before the holiday weekend. So our calendar proposal reflects that schedule as well. And next year, our winter breaks will be slightly different across the peninsula, about just a few days. But in Newport News, we are maintaining our Monday through Friday two week winter break. Now in terms of spring break, all six school divisions on the peninsula will continue to observe the break as the first Monday through Friday in April. And now I'd like to share a few highlights from the 2023-24 proposed calendar. In August, our new teachers will report on Monday the 7th and returning teachers and teacher assistants will report on Thursday, August 17th. And as mentioned earlier, the first day for students will be Monday, August 28th. Now, the calendar committee spent a lot of time working on days for teacher planning time, especially given the challenge of carving out time for planning at the elementary level. So almost every month has time designated for teacher planning, which was strategically placed while considering grading periods and student assessments. Now, we also work to reduce the number of half days given the impact on families and absenteeism. However, we're trying something new next year. We are designating two days when elementary students will dismiss for a half day so that their teachers have planning time in the afternoon in their buildings, while secondary teachers and students maintain a full instructional day. The first of these days will be September 22nd, and the second will be later in February. Now, we've had discussions with our transportation department, which can accommodate this new approach, and that will allow us to see if this flexible schedule will be effective. Now, in looking at October, schools will be closed for students for a full teacher planning day on October 2nd, which is around the midpoint of the grading period. And on October 20th, teachers will have a half day for professional development in the morning with family conferences in the afternoon. Now, as we enter 2023, for, and based on the positive feedback from teachers last month, we continue the teacher planning day for the day after the winter break ends, which will be on Tuesday, January 2nd, with students reporting on January 3rd. And at the end of the first semester, Thursday, January 25th, will be a teacher and support staff work day, and Friday, January 26th, will be a full day for professional development, which is consistent with our other school divisions on the peninsula. In February, students, elementary students, again, will dismiss for a half day on the 16th so that their teachers have planning time in the afternoon in their buildings, while secondary teachers and students maintain a full instructional day. And in rounding out the month, on President's Day, February 19th, schools will be closed and 12-month employees will report. And as I mentioned earlier, spring break will continue to be observed as the first week in February, I'm sorry, in April, <laughs> which will be the first through the fifth for all Peninsula School Divisions. And like this current school year, we have designated a teacher planning day for the day after the spring break ends, which will be on Monday, April 8th, with students returning on Tuesday, April 9th. In closing out the year, the calendar uh, schedules graduation ceremony dates for Saturday and Sunday, June 8th and 9th. And it also designates Wednesday, June 12th as the last day for students and Thursday, June 13th as the last work day for teachers. 
Now this is a visual representation of the calendar. It includes our grading period dates in the box in the lower left hand corner. And to the right of it are the religious observances that occur during the school week, as well as a key for early dismissals, our staff development and teacher planning days, and our holiday observances. So in terms of our next steps, we will continue to solicit feedback from the community on the proposed calendar to, through a link to the calendar on our school and division web pages with the opportunity for viewers to ask questions or post suggestions. And based on that feedback, we will revise the calendar draft if needed. And then the final draft calendar will come before the school board for action at your March 21st monthly meeting. And once approved, we'll publicize the calendar through our school newsletters and all of our electronic communications such as news break, news lines, and board briefs, and on our school websites and on the school division's webpage. So this concludes my report this evening. I will be happy to answer your questions or to note your suggestions. Thank you very much. <clears throat> All right, do I have any comments or questions? Yes, comment. Thank you for your thorough report as well. Um, April, I'm sorry. The spring break? Yeah, but that, yes. that's, ne never mind that question. The, um, my second question, someone had emailed and asked about why couldn't the elementary st students, um, why couldn't the last day of school be the last day um, for of high school students because um, technically high school is over when seniors are done, but it seems like kids stay in school three additional days or so. Based on the number of hours required by the state, what's the rationale for keeping them in school the additional three days? And our high school students are also in school taking exams those so, days. Okay, so right. high schools are finishing those last three days. Right, taking the last exams. three days with students, and it's it's really to make meet our requirement in terms of our instructional hours. We exceed the 990, mm -hmm. but we have to ensure that we have the instructional hours in the right areas. Right mm -hmm. now, our calendar is at 176 days, <clears throat> and so we try to maximize the instructional hours as much as possible. Possible. So um, we can look at that if we could reduce that. Uh, but right now, we didn't want to start with a draft with fewer than 176 days. Okay. I just want so we to, will to consider be able that to explain it for the for the right. public so they would understand exactly. what the rationale was. And for. that's what it is. We're trying to maximize instructional time, and we realize that's at the end of the school year. So it's something that we're going to we're taking an additional look at as well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Brown. Uh, my question is just related to um, uh, pu people in the public who have feedback on the proposed calendar. Yes. What is the simplest and easiest way for them to get their feedback to you? Oh, to go on our website, right on our web page or any school web page, especially on the school division's web page, you will see Newport News calendar. You can click on and post your suggestion. It goes to our mailbox that they actually come to me directly as well. So we appreciate that. We are collecting information. We've had a lot of responses in just a few days. Um, uh, quite often it, it it relates to a person's personal situation and we have to still take that into consideration. Other times we have some good ideas, good suggestions that we've taken back to the calendar committee. So we will be doing that. So we encourage people to post and, and make those suggestions. Thank you. Okay, anybody on this side? Because we do yeah. have a full month, as we said, between now and when we bring the calendar back. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Well, I'm looking forward to the eclipse as well, so I would be taking a day off probably. But yes, yes. I work at Jefferson Lab, and um, we actually yeah, will be know. making sure that everyone in the division has some access to activities and resources to observe. So uh, students who are in school will at least get the opportunity to to enjoy. Oh, great. Thank you. And I, I do appreciate that. I wasn't Absolutely. Aware. Yes. <laughs> and we have uh, NASA is doing the same thing. So I don't oh, want to take the credit just for us. But NASA is also doing the same thing. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Exciting. All right. Okay. Anything else? 
Thank you so much. We're excited of the team that's working with you to get our calendar uh, prim and proper for us. Okay, let's see. We are at 5.04, which is the attendance report, 5.05, the membership report, 5.06, construction report. Board members, you have received copies of these reports. Are there any questions at this time? So, um, hearing none, we'll move on to item 5.06, comments by the interim superintendent, Dr. Mitchell. Thank you, Madam Chair. Correction is 5.07. Oh, sorry, 5.07. I apologize. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Thank you. February is Black History Month. And across the school division, our students and staff are recognizing the contributions of African Americans through displays, special events, artwork, and creative writings. If you haven't had the opportunity to check out some of the school displays, I encourage <coughs> you to do so. February is also Career and Technical Education Month, so I want to take a moment to thank all of our CTE educators. Our CTE teachers lead more than 75 courses that prepare our students to earn industry certifications and also to gain marketable job skills. I really want to thank you for ensuring that our students are college career and citizen ready. Please join our PTA. Please join our PTA. We need the voices of our parents. Every child, one voice. There is a statewide PTA membership challenge. So the Virginia PTA has launched a statewide PTA membership challenge. So we are issuing a challenge to all of our parents, our grandparents, our community members and staff. Please join your school's PTA. PTA membership and dues do support our students by funding additional educational opportunities. And PTA members also play a crucial role by serving as advocates for our students. We invite you to join the PTA uh, because increasing our membership makes it possible to provide important educational resources. It helps you to speak up on important issues and create a stronger school community. So again, we encourage you to join our PTA. Earlier in the presentation, three committees were mentioned, and I just want to touch on those three committees, the Family Engagement Advisory Committee, the School Safety Advisory Committee, and the Rights and Responsibilities Advisory Committee. We do have an application deadline, which is March the 3rd at 5 p.m. Newport News Public Schools is truly seeking advisory committee members to enhance family engagement, school safety, and students' rights and responsibilities. Designed to offer a broad range of opportunities for community engagement, the advisory committees will meet on a regular basis to provide input, support, and advice to the division and the school board. Parents, Newport News employees, and community members interested in serving on one of the advisory committees are encouraged to complete the application on our website it's nnschools.org by Friday, March the 3rd. This is just one of many efforts underway to re-engage and solicit input from our community. We are looking forward to working with these committee, committees to advance Newport News Public Schools. And last but not least, as a reminder, on Friday, March the 10th, schools are closed for students. It is a professional development half day for our staff and an opportunity for family conferences in the afternoon if needed. Also, students do not report on Monday, March 13th. It is a full teacher planning day. Madam Chair, that concludes my comments for this evening. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to item six, another opportunity to hear from the public. Are there any cards? Okay, and Mr. Richardson, did you want to ask your, um, state your question? Oh, we I'm won't right. respond directly, but you can say what you'd like and we can get back with you. Uh, you guys talked about the item I was interested in, was the uh, alternate <coughs> K through five uh, program. Okay. And 
Dr. Mitchell talked about making it happen this year. Yes, sir. I think is uh, absolutely required to get the bad actors out of a learning environment so the other students can uh, be all they can be. And they can't do that with disruption and potential other violence in the classroom. So I'm happy. Great, we're glad to hear that. <laughs> Now we will go ahead and move on to the agenda uh, to matters by the school board. I know we're going a bit long, um, so if you would like to share, you do have the opportunity. Uh, Ms. Manajero will, oh, did she, did, she had to leave. We ran it's her out. early. Um, it is late. Young lady. Mr. Brown, that means you're next. All right. So I take her time and, and everybody else's time. No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll try, to, I'll try to be brief. I had uh, promised the community that I would um, lay out my own uh, items that I think are important for safety, and I, I intend to do so tonight. Um, I want to say that we all have a stake in safety and the well-being of our students, uh, and I'm going to propose a set of actions that I believe will help us achieve that goal. Uh, to achieve this goal, um, I'm going to propose a number of actions in the areas of policy adoption, personnel appointments, board reports, and operations. So starting with board reports, I'm proposing that we develop a discipline report per school, uh, which covers the number of infractions by category as reported to the state. This will give us a better understanding of the types of discipline issues that we are facing and allow us to address them more effectively. Uh, I've requested this item to be added to um, item five of board docs, but I understand that we're gonna be working that through our, our dashboard, mm -hmm. and uh, I accept that in the interim. Uh, we should also develop a consequence report per school, which covers the consequences provided by the infraction category as reported to the state. And finally, I believe we need an audit of the division safety plan to ensure that we're prepared for any eventuality. Uh, I believe these three board reports will facilitate a more targeted changes to our rights and responsibilities handbook. That's why I asked the, um, part of the reason why I asked the question tonight, are we making sure that we're being uh, deliberate and not rushing through uh, that um, review of our rights and responsibilities handbook because I think uh, we're going to uh, gather a lot of uh, information that's going to elucidate the changes that need to be made through those three reports. <clears throat> In terms of operations, I'm proposing four ideas for implementation. First, I think we need to provide ownership, transparency, and feedback of the discipline refer referrals directly to the teachers themselves. This means uh, enabling the teachers to enter the write-ups directly into Synergy across the division allowing them to view the status of their referral in Synergy and allowing them to appeal an administrator ruling of the referral in Synergy. So essentially the teachers become the owners of their referral data. Um, second, I do think we need to require teachers and staff to uh, drill on active shooter, bomb threat, and other scenarios as identified by law enforcement on teacher work days. The board should review the results of the training to monitor how well staff understand the safety protocols. This is one thing to have the safety protocols to go through them, but it's another thing for the board to make sure that people actually understand them. Uh, third, uh, we need to uh, actively recruit parents to join the PTAs at their schools. I, I heard you know tonight, and we've heard many calls to form different committees. What I want to caution the, the public about is that it's important to utilize our, utilize our PTA because we already have an organization that is founded for parents to have a voice. And uh, the PTA has a robust process for consolidating the parents' voice for both policy and legislative change, not just locally, but statewide and nationally as well. Uh, let's appreciate the PTA that we have rather than inventing another committee that disperses our parent volunteers and dilutes their voice. Uh, finally, uh, the South Morrison site should be operational for students on short-term suspension to keep them learning instead of sitting at home. I know that we received a report last year uh, with a proposal on the South Morrison site to use as a as a um, as a classroom for alternative uh, learning, and the board should ask for an immediate timeline to get that site up and running for our students. Doesn't necessarily have to be the South Morrison site, but that was the proposal that was offered by the superintendent, and I'd like to see that see us follow through on that. Turning to policy adoption, I'm proposing three ideas. First, I call upon this board to adopt my policy proposal for parent accountability. Uh, my parent accountability proposal establishes a procedure for the board to make referrals of parents who fail to provide discipline for their children to domestic court. We must hold parents accountable for their children's behavior in order to create a safe and productive learning environment. 
for all the kids. Uh, my proposal is already supported by established Virginia law and the board should employ it immediately. Second, I'm proposing that we adopt my policy proposal for emergency special meeting for violence. This policy ensures that the board receives a timely recommendation from the superintendent on staff actions following a violent event on school property. It is critical that we act with greater urgency in the wake of a tragedy to bring closure for the community and the staff. Third, and I'm sure that uh, I'll get plenty of uh, uh, hate mail on, on this, but I still hate cell phones. I hate cell phones in school. Cell phones have been a disruption ever since we adopted them in my first term on the board, and I believe that was a mistake. What's worse is that they are a source for bullying and harassment of our students. I have yet to see any positive benefits of having cell phones in our schools. I put my cell phone in a locker every day at work before I can go into work because I happen to work at a classified facility. Nothing bad happens to me. I'm okay. I'm okay. I don't get the shakes. I manage to go into work, do my job, walk back out, get my cell phone out of the locker, and walk home. I think our students can handle that too. They can put their cell phones in their lockers, go about their day, and pick their cell phones up at the end of the day, just like I do. Lastly, I'm proposing two personnel appointments. I believe that this board, we need to appoint an executive director of safety to prioritize safety as an essential part of operations. I think we also um, need a chief communications officer. I've been saying that for the last year. We talked, we, we know we saw tonight uh, much discussion about communications. That needs to be uh, a high priority and making it a high priority would be you put it at the chief level to ensure that we're communicating effectively with parents, teachers, and staff. We should stop underestimating the importance of consistent and targeted communication for the public. We need to have an office and that office should be fully staffed. Uh, for those of you who are counting at home, that was 12 ideas on safety. Three for board reports, four operational recommendations, three policy proposals, and two personnel proposals. In conclusion, I urge everyone to support these proposed actions to make our school safer and more supportive for our students. Together we can bring a brighter future for the next generation. Thank you for the time. Thank you for your constructive input, Mr. Brown. Mr. Harris. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Brown, you know, grown-ups do get shakes with, without <laughs> right? Just to let you know. But no, I, I want to talk to the, uh, um, the guests here tonight. I, I really appreciate you all coming down and voicing your concerns and opinions. Um, It's not often you hear the same message from everyone. And you all, all we all come from different walks of life. Um, some are Virginia natives and may have never left here. Some of us, you know, have lived around the world, across the United States of America. But the message was consistent and clear. And it's been that way prior to this incident. Um, so the public has spoken. Uh, board, I hope uh, we've been paying attention, and it is be, no, and do at this moment, Madam Chairman. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, yeah, I, I made this statement before. Um, you know, at the end of the day, if we have people in places uh, that's not prepared to move and take care of this district. Um, I think as a board, we're gonna make sure we, you know, support the interim superintendent and in, in, in making sure, you know, that we put people where they need to be. And that's the only way it can happen. Um, so I uh, thank you all for coming. I, I, I hear you for sure. Thank you. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Mr. Hunter. Uh, I have no comments. Uh, thank you. I do have one comment. I do want to say, uh, again, uh, cheers to, uh, Clerk, or Clerk Day, thank you for keeping us on track. Thank you for doing all the things that you do. Great things are still happening in Newport News Public Schools, and I want to believe that. Because, you know, your mind, you know, it's, just, it's mindset, right? It's mindset. So I, I do want to say it's mindset. So I'm going to always say there are great things happening in Newport News Public Schools. Yes. And then there, there are hiccups that we do have. And, um, but I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to believe there are great things happening in Newport News. And if no one on this board believes there's no great things happening in Newport News, I'm not sure if they need to be sitting up here. All right? This, this is a wonderful place that had two daughters, 
graduated from here. My wife has done 38 years here. Um, I mean, I love education. I mean, we, we hear you. I heard it last week, and uh, we heard it again. Um, and um, But I do want to say, I want us also to be positive that, you know what, fear creates fear. I mean, you know, we don't want to also have a, an environment of fear, you know, because that's no place to teach as well. But I do want to have a place that, you know, uh, kids are happy to come. But that starts with us as well. You know, we have to truly, truly believe that, you know, there, there's a better on the other side of the bridge. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, all those who are in here, and those who listen on TV, you know, we, you know, we are all, it takes us. It's not one of us or not seven of us here. It takes all of us here. And there, there are, there do, people do make mistakes, right? But we need us to be positive. And so I'm going to continue to say there are great things happening in Newport News. You know, every day someone's passing the tests. Every day we, we're, we're doing a championship. Uh, there's more positive unfortunately then they're negative unfortunately like we know the squeaky wheel you know gets the grease you know if it if it you know if it, if it bleeds it leads but you know there's some great things that we do here in newport news and i don't want any teacher back there or any cafeteria worker or bus driver or whomever there may be to you know don't get discouraged that you know we do hear you you know, and I do hear you. And um, just want us to also take some positive here. You know, we also leave on a positive note. And so my positive note is great things are happening in Newport News. And I hope they continue to happen here in Newport News. And with your help and all those out listening, I'm sure that we can get ourselves uh, back on the right track. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Amon. Oh, sure. Thank you. Um, Searle's Law. Um, I want to build on some of what um, Mr. Brown said, uh, some, of, some of your ideas. Um, you mentioned, you know, a safety audit, and I kind of wanted to tie that with the mention of the school security consultant um, to conduct a school safety assessment. Some of the examples given were very physical assessments, doors and those sorts of things, and I would like to see, be it through the audit or through that consultant coming in, so, um, building on to that uh, an examination not just of our physical structures but of our procedures our training um, recommendations that can go you know even beyond just the physical I think that's that's important um, and I, I appreciate everyone's comments tonight and one of the ones that spoke to me among many of them but I've heard it time and time again I know there's frustration with, with parents and community members wanting to come in and volunteer within the division. Um, and I know there's been, um, I perceive that there's been some resistance to it, and I don't know if it's institutional or not, but I would encourage us to look at how we can do that. I think it's, I think any objections are certainly very practically overcome. If we're concerned with, you know, student identity, or privacy. Well, if somebody wants to volunteer, we can do background checks. We can have them sign an agreement that this is important. You don't, you know, go and tell Mary's mom about what Susie did in school. Um, you know, I think there's, you know, absolutely ways we can involve parents and community members that want to be involved safely um, to bring them involved. Because I think there are many members of the community that want to be a part of the solution in Newport News. So I'd really like to, I'd really like to see us um, find a way to do that. Um, and I do like the idea of, you know, celebrating our successes. I think that's important to highlight the, we've got a lot of work to do and I know we want it done fast and we want it done fast and accurately. So we will, we will do our best and work our hardest to make that happen. Um, but celebrating the successes is important. You know, it can be as, as micro as if a, you know, student, and I've seen it in other divisions. I haven't seen it in ours, but, um, I, maybe I just missed it. So please, if you see things, send them my way. Um, but, you know, if, you know, Susie Smith wins regional field hockey player, um, you know, this year, put those up on the athletics and the school websites. And I think we all try, but maybe we don't always remember and it doesn't get communicated. But, but those are the things you can see and you can share with, you know, friends and family. And 
um, school members and stuff. So I think that together will work. Um, but thank you to everyone who came and spoke. It was certainly took notes and I will be looking back over it, absolutely. Thank you, Mrs. Amon. And Mrs. Alger? Yes, thank you. Uh, I want to thank everyone uh, here for, for being here and staying this long. This is, this is great. Um, I've been taking notes and listening intently. Um, I hit the ground running. I have visited schools, uh, talked to all sorts of folks, uh, including today. And all of us here, every single one of us here are committed, uh, including yourselves out in the audience. And that's what it's going to take. It's going to take everyone in this room uh, with ideas uh, and with action. And that, to me, is really important. And if all of us could tighten up, if all of us could, can lift, uh, you know, um, just, just make things better, uh, things will improve. Um, just by walking around uh, different buildings, um, using my personal experience in terms of high expectations, uh, you will notice that people will start to, to pick it up. And that's what we need. Um, you know, uh, collaboration, uh, communication. Communication is absolutely key. And uh, what I heard um, from Dr. Mitchell uh, is that that she is committed as well as everyone else in terms of communicating uh, and communicating effectively and openly and that's important but thank you uh, and uh, I'm proud to serve I'm proud to be here today uh, and I'm committed uh, to each and every one of you thank you thank you so much Dr. Best thank you I'll be brief um, good evening one of the positive things that's happening in Newport News Public Schools right now is our students' artwork is on display at Downing Grove's Cultural Arts Center. And if you haven't had an opportunity to get out there and to see um, some of the artwork by our students, I encourage you to do so. I believe it will be up until the end of the month, but they are simply um, amazing. So please take a minute to go by there. I too would like to thank everyone that has come out to speak this evening and those of you that have left as well and those of you that are still on in our um, listening audience. We are listening to you and we appreciate hearing your voice. We want to um, do this right, not necessarily fast, but we want to address the issues that we have and, and do them the right way. And I just want to leave you with this. Um, we re received numerous emails and letters over the past month. I mean, just a large amount. And um, one of the um, things that several people have said is that, that they are afraid to speak up. Now, for me, I guess it was the era that I was raised in. I am not afraid of any person. I, that's just the way I was raised. If you're my boss, if you're my supervisor, I'm going to give you the respect that your position is due. But I will not be afraid of you. And I'm telling our teachers and our staff members, you don't have to be afraid. And you definitely don't have to be afraid of us, and you don't have to be afraid of retaliation. If there is a concern that you all have, and as most of you all have done, you have expressed it in an appropriate manner. You have re relayed the information to us. And some of you have even, thank you so much, come up with solutions as to how to address the problems. But I think we need to, that, that, that climate and culture of fear, it begins with the mindset. And, and you don't have to be afraid, but I can't not be afraid for you. You're going to have to make that decision that you're not afraid and stand on what you um, believe in. So I just encourage you to be brave. That's what we want to teach our students as well. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Well, I just want to, uh, again, welcome Dr. Mitchell and Mrs. Alger. Appreciate you during this time that we're moving forward with purpose. I know that you will both um, help lead us well. Uh, I understand we have some as aspiring leaders from ODU cohort. Um, if you guys would please stand. Thank you for being here this evening and joining us. 
and understanding, um, I'm sure, in a cohort on leadership that leadership has many facets and is quite complex. But the biggest thing I'm hoping that you get out of it is it takes heart. So uh, we're really glad to have you with us. And we invite you back because there's more uh, <laughs> after this that we can share with you. We can get them a provisional license, right? They can, oh, we can. <laughs> they can come in. Don't leave. <laughs> Um, let's see, I'm very thankful that we got our slide in on the PTA. I'd actually attended our um, district-wide PTA and realized that um, there's, a, mm, I want to say, less than 2,500 parents, if that, in all of our PTAs across our district of 40-plus uh, schools. So that's something that we need to work on as a group to, to increase. And as Mr. Brown said, that is an, an advocacy group and a voice group too, and one that we really would like to see um, increase and be encouraged here. The board, uh, some of the board members have been doing what we're um, affectionately terming boardwalks. It's outside of being invited to uh, events that are at our schools, but just coming and checking to see if there's anything we can do to help, just to say thank you, uh, stick the course, um, and make sure that our schools see us as well as uh, Dr. Mitchell mentioned from our, our leadership as well. So we're hoping that when we're changing our climate and culture that it's visible. It's not just behind the scenes of us crunching numbers and trying to figure out the best way to spend the money to answer the challenges that we're having, but that you actually see, um, have the look and feel of Newport News Public Schools that we are really striving for as a board here. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't say that um, thank you to Senator Monty Mason and Delegate um, Mike Mullins. I spent a couple of days on the Hill uh, advocating for things for our district and for um, school districts across the, uh, across the nation. Um, I got the chance to speak to leaders who were concerned about what's going on in schools and want to know how they can help. And so that was a unique opportunity, too. You can imagine that with our current situation that we had just in January, um, I had a listening ear. And so I felt very responsible to be able to share where we need help with mental health, with safety and security, and where we need opportunities for our students to have things to do outside of schools. And then um, locally, we are w awaiting our budget to see how we fare here uh, in Virginia. But we've all spent some time, uh, several of us have spent some time in Richmond uh, speaking to lobbyists and lawmakers so that we can get the support that we need. And that was loudly heard by Monty Mason and Delegate Mike Mullins. Um, in the governor's budget, there's $1.5 million for Rich Neck. Um, and uh, there are some other opportunities that are going are gonna to be available by way of grants that Newport News will definitely be applying for. So with that, I hope we've given you a lot to think about this evening. No, we are continuing to work, and we do need to continue to hear from you. Meeting adjourned.